I am so delighted to welcome you to our second installment of our Saturday Bible study that we have during the month of January. Our theme this year is Reading Between the Lines, Alternative Readings of Scripture, which is code language for subversive readings of Scripture. Um, and we're delighted this morning to have the Reverend Dr. Aubrey Hendricks, Jr. with us who is a distinguished scholar in the area of New Testament, specifically in Jesus' message and its political motivation or meanings and how that might have an impact on how we read and interact with God's word. He has a degree from Princeton Theological, Princeton University, I was gonna say Princeton Theological Seminary, Princeton University, and is currently on the faculty at Columbia. His publications include a book called The Universe Leads Towards Justice, which is um, political readings of the New Testament. And um, one of his favorite publications is a work of fiction called Living Waters, which I really enjoyed. Um, widely published, and you will see him often on C-SPAN and CNN, Dr. Hendricks is a provocative and prophetic voice. And we are delighted to have him with us this morning. So please join me in welcoming the Reverend Dr. Aubrey Hendricks. Good morning. Well, I am particularly glad to be here today. And in fact, I'd say I'm honored to have been uh, thought well enough of to be invited to a, uh, to a church like this, a very progressive church, one that's known across the nation. And, uh, and those in the know know how progressive it is thankful for that. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. And I'm thankful to see my old friend, Reverend Dr. Judy Fentress Williams. I knew her when she was just Judy Fentress. Uh, she exemplifies, I think, the, uh, just the highest levels of, uh, of the balancing between the highest levels of biblical scholarship uh, with the deep and committed uh, church uh, membership in service, so I'm so glad to see her. And I see some others here. I won't uh, call the roll because I'll leave somebody out, but as, as, as I heard somebody say down south, good morning, saints and ain'ts. <laughs> you know, to talk about the politics of Jesus, pardon me, let me say, I am just, I've just gotten over the flu, so please excuse me if I cough a little. And if I falter a little, I don't have my full complement of strength. But as uh, old folks down in Farmville, Virginia, where I'm from, would say, if you give me some hope, I didn't say help, hope, H-O-L-P. If you'll hope me, <laughs> I'll be all right. <clears throat> you know, it's uh, always important to talk about the politics of Jesus because it's such an important part of his message. But uh, this is a particularly needy time because we have uh, at the head of our government uh, an embodiment of hatred uh, and racism and callousness and uncaring, which is the worst thing, uncaring for anyone but himself in his inner circle. That's so very dangerous. What's even more dangerous is that a good portion of those who call themselves Christian actually support this person. And so that is giving, uh, that, that is really, in a sense, forgive the word, it, that's bastardizing uh, the gospel. And so we must stand tall against it and not allow those uh, who are not forces of justice to denigrate the gospel and to uh, make it bereft of its full power. And so uh, it's important to talk about the politics of Jesus, the politics of Jesus. So to posit the concept of a politics of Jesus is to say that Jesus was, uh, or, or to say that Jesus is political, is uh, really to say that there is a political dimension to the earthly ministry of Jesus. His whole ministry wasn't political, of course, but politics was a very, very important 
dimension of uh, the ministry of Jesus Christ. When I first learned that, it knocked me off my feet because I grew up hearing folks say, I ain't into politics, I'm a Christian, which is like saying, you know, just give me Jesus and you can have the, and the devil can have the rest of the world. In fact, that's a song sort of, isn't it? Just give me Jesus. Um, you know, it has a nice tune, but the words are sort of problematic for me, I must tell you. <clears throat> but when we talk about politics, of course, we're not talking about par partisan politics. Uh, politics in its most basic form is really concerned with distribution of wealth and resources and uh, freedom and authority and uh, institutions and, and uh, mobility and movement, freedom, distribution, all the good things, the good necessary things uh, to have a decent life in this world. Uh, uh, to paraphrase Jesus, in a sense it's about <coughs> To paraphrase Jesus, uh, it is, and what is the paraphrase? Now, I told y'all I got the flu now. <laughs> and y'all ain't hoping me enough, I guess. <laughs> I was just uh, kidding, I remember. Um, <laughs> the, I forgot again. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> that we might have life and that with abundance. And that includes here on earth. In fact, that's all we know. I mean, we, you know, we, we hear about heaven, we might believe in heaven, but we don't know anything about it really. This is us. And uh, uh, one has to ask, what kind of Messiah would Jesus be if he didn't care about what happened to the people on the earth? if he didn't care about the suffering and the deprivation of people on earth. So, um, and when we look at Jesus in the Gospels, and we see that uh, his main concern, the main thing he's concerned about with regard to distribution and redistribution um, has to do with wealth and poverty. In fact, Jesus talks about poor people and poverty more than anything else in the Gospels. More than anything else, that's Jesus' main subject. Very interesting because it's not really preached quite that much throughout the body of Christ. Um, if it, and if it was Jesus' main concern, it should at least be, you know, pretty close to the top of our hierarchy of Christian concerns. Um, but that says something about those who have <clears throat> set and distorted the... Uh, the definitions of the faith. Um, I will not name them or describe them, but we know who they are. And uh, I will also say when, when Judy and I were working for our doctorates, you could count us biblical scholars on, one, on two hands. They did not want us in the academy because those who control the definitions from the Bible really uh, controls society. And so I mean, we see some vestiges of that, like with people like um, <clears throat> Pat Robertson and Jerry Falwell Jr. and folk like that who are very concerned about controlling society, such that the son of the founder of the moral majority would cleave to a man who is as immoral as they come. And we just found out that he paid off at least one porn star to keep her mouth shut. And he admitted to being a serial molester of women. And they still cleave to him. Well, that's what you call ideological Christianity. They're more concerned with their own ideological interests and needs than they really are about the gospel. So we want to talk about what the gospel really is. So, Jesus' main concern was about poor and poverty, about distribution and redistribution of wealth and resources. And we see that from the very beginning, from the very first line of what, what Luke presents as the very first um, uh, uh, sermon of Jesus' ministry. Jesus says, uh, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, uh, not just to make me jump and holler and bump my head on the ceiling fall out and vomit and say all kinds of 
crazy stuff and claim that it's speaking in tongues. I'm sorry, y'all. I'm just saying it. That just bothers me. No, it said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, to bring good news to the poor. That's the first line of this first sermon. That gives us a sense of who he is. And even in the transcendent beauty of the Beatitudes, in the Lucan Beatitudes particularly, which we understand because of its brevity to be the, uh, the earliest and the most authentic form of the Beatitudes, even in the Beatitudes, in its beauty, its transcendent beauty, it says, blessed are you poor folk. And then it turns around and says, but you know, you rich folk, you all need to look out. Now, I want to get something clear. Jesus speaks against the rich. But that had a different meaning in his time. Because at that time, uh, they had uh, a worldview of what we call a culture of limited good. They thought that the good things in the world were just limited, not unlimited. And so um, everybody was supposed to have a certain amount, an equal amount, really. If someone had too much, if someone got real rich, what it meant in that culture is that they had taken from someone else. And that was usually the case because they didn't have any economies of scale where they could replicate things. You're a carpenter, you can make things once and uh, you know, one at a time by hand. Um, you can't you know, plow and, and plant and harvest, but so many crops by yourself. So if one was rich then in their eyesight, and that's not only in Jesus' time, that goes all the way back. You see Plato talking about that, that <clears throat> this concept of limited good. So it doesn't mean, being rich in itself doesn't mean that um, one should have woes. It, it should mean that if, if one is cheap and doesn't, doesn't share. But um, what it really talks about, those who become rich um, through greed and dishonesty and through theft and through lying to folk and building great buildings and putting your name on, well, I'm sorry. I, I just, I got evils mixed up, you know. So, yes, a foundational dimension of the gospel is political. And that is the politics of Jesus. And his is a revolutionary politics, we would say. Some say radical, uh, that it gets to the roots of things. Others would say, as myself, that his politics was a revolutionary politics because he sought to upend the political structures and the economic relationships and arrangements that so unjustly ruled and exploited the people in Jewish Palestine, or Israel as it came to be called. And by extension, uh, Jesus sought to upend all oppressive regimes and institutions um, and kingdoms in the world by extension because he did tell his dis disciples to go out to the world and to become apostles or those who were sent out to send his message of love and justice and his vision of a just world. So what is the significance of that? Well, where does that come from? Is that new with Jesus? Did Jesus just transform things? Well, no. When we look in the Hebrew Bible, as I understand it, I hope my Hebrew Bible scholar um, does not contradict me, but as from my reading, the, the concept and the term that occurs most often in the Hebrew Bible, uh, much of which would, would have been with, uh, what Jesus was familiar with, is the word mishpah, uh, uh, justice. Justice, the central ethical concept of the Bible. One must do justice to others. And it's egalitarian justice, because if it says, love your neighbor as yourself, it means one wants, has uh, to, to want for one's neighbor, the same thing as one wants for oneself, and that's equality. If you want your neighbor to be rich, if you want yourself to be rich, then you should want your neighbor to be rich. Now, I want to be rich and you be poor. That's, it's egalitarian justice uh, in, in the world. And where does that come from? What is its roots? Well, the root event of our faith is a class liberation 
event. In the book of Genesis, we see the stories of individuals of ever-increasing faith. Abraham, Joseph, Lot. But it is with the Exodus that the story of individuals becomes the story of a class, a collective story, a class of people, the Hebrews. Hebrews, Hebrew did not denote a religion. Because as you recall, when the Hebrews went out into the desert with Moses, they were worshiping all kinds of stuff. Golden calves and wilding out and, you know, y'all forgive me, but I think our president would have been very comfortable in that setting. I'm just saying. <laughs> and so the Hebrews were uh, uh, what, what identified them, what was the basis of their collective identity was the fact that they were oppressed by the Pharaoh. Uh, I mean, Hebrew itself sort of don't, denotes being an outsider, not an insider in the political economy. So, uh, uh, one way it can be, uh, it can be defined as uh, he crossed over or an, an outsider. And uh, how do we know that Hebrews is a class identity and that, G, that God was cleaving to them um, in their class identity, their oppressed class identity and not having to do with any kind of religious notions because when we look at Exodus 3, 7 through 8, it reads this way. God says to them, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them. Deliver them from what? From their oppression, from their suffering. That is the root event of our faith. And Jesus refers to that often because he evokes the name of, of Moses often. And, and Moses' name always bring, brought to mind his hearers, uh, to his hearers the, uh, the Exodus. Um, I'm going to, what I'd like to do here is a couple things. I want to do a, a short survey of, the Jude, of, of what became Judaism that led up to Jesus' time that informed and helped form his, his, his worldview in the way that he uh, expressed uh, what God had told him to do. Um, and then to talk about Jesus and uh, the conditions in which he lived and uh, to which he was uh, responding. And so we see the Exodus, and I think the, the, next, the next important epoch we might look to is the uh, period of the Judges. Um, the Judges from uh, Hebrew Shufatim, meaning uh, he judges or they judge or are ones who do justice, ones who do justice. Uh, the judges, to be a judge, you didn't have to be a, be a real religious person. I mean, uh, Samson is the best known judge and he wasn't the most religious person you would ever meet. <laughs> no, no, judges were those, uh, those who did justice, those who stood up, they were, they were uh, ad hoc, occasional leaders. They were those who stood up to lead the people uh, against those who would oppress and exploit them. You see, at the time when the Hebrews left Pharaoh um, and being so beaten down by Pharaoh, they decided they didn't want to have any more big eyes and little U's. So they uh, had a sort of an egalitarian uh, uh, confederacy of, of tribes. And the heads of the tribes, they made collective uh, decisions. That was very dangerous, though, because when you're circumscribed and surrounded by kingdoms and, uh, uh, and various, various tribes who have kings, and you have these folk over here who don't have a king, it's like they are not only <laughs> do they look like uh, uh, something to be open season on, but it also, it, it, can, it sets up a bad precedent and a bad model for kings, because folks will say, wait a minute, we, we got a king, but they don't have no king. 
So maybe we need to rethink this thing. Well, so uh, Israel, so the Hebrews were always embattled. Someone, you know, you read through the Old Testament, somebody always was at them. Man, them folk were fighting like crazy. I mean, so when you, <laughs> when you look at their leaders, their leaders had to be pretty tough to be leading them. Well, because they were always in battle and because they did not have one, uh, one head, one king, um, <clears throat> when they did not have a, a standing army, they didn't have a, 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 a standing uh, military organization. So when they were um, embattled, when they were endangered, a judge would rise up who would lead them, who would strike a blow uh, for power. And that was the definition of a judge. It didn't have to do with, um, I mean, that, I'm not saying they weren't religious, but it, that was not the definition. A judge was one who stood up and fought against oppression. And the period of judges is very, uh, is, is very significant. Because, pardon me, um, it's during this period, maybe shortly thereafter, but I believe it's during this period, that this notion of kingdom of God really came to the fore. Malkot Shemayim, Malkot Shemayim, which literally means the, king, uh, uh, the sole sovereignty of the heavens or the kingdom of the heavens because they thought at that time the name of God was too holy to, to pronounce. Um, and what it meant, Malkot Sumaya, meant that only God had the right to rule and dominate. No man, woman, or child had the right to rule over, to dominate, to lord over other people. Or one could be in a, in a uh, position of service or leadership, but that didn't mean dominationist a dominationist role. And we see uh, we see this in, I think, exemplified in the story of Gideon. You might recall Gideon was a bad man. He was so bad that they said, look, man, we are so tired of always having to scramble and get an army together. Um, when, <clears throat> whenever, <coughs> pardon me, to get an army together whenever we are uh, in trouble. So we want to ask you, would you please be our king? And not only you, but your sons after you. They were asking him, they were offering him hereditary kingship over the Hebrews. And uh, you might recall what uh, he said. Getting said to them in Judges 8, I will not rule over you, and my son will not rule over you. The Lord alone will rule over you. The sole sovereignty of God. When you hear of kingdom of God, it means the sole sovereignty of God. No one has the right to rule but God. God's kingdom of justice is God's uh, just sole sovereignty over the world. And so that came out of the period of the judges. Also, this, this notion of, uh, of Messiah came <clears throat> a little later than that period, though, but as well. But Messiah, and the first Messiah was whom? Not, I know you know. Saul, yes, sir, Saul. Messiah means the anointed, right? Moshiach, anointed. And who was it that anointed? Saul? It was Samuel. And um, why? Well, because Gideon wouldn't be a king, and there was no king, but they were still getting beaten up, so they wanted, uh, they wanted Saul to go and lead them, because Saul must have been another tough guy. And, and I mean, I want to emphasize when I say tough guy, I want you to realize we're, we're talking about real human beings, not cardboard characters like uh, presented to us sometimes. That's why the the King James Version is a problem because it has people talking like they're Shakespearean or Elizabethan actors, and it doesn't give a sense of them as being everyday down-to-earth people like everyone else. For instance, um, 
the Gal Galileans, uh, <laughs> the Galileans were, were sort of country folk, and uh, their pronunciation of Hebrew and Aramaic was slurred. So, for instance, um, Eleazar was a priestly name. Well, we have in scripture, well, uh, a Galilean pronunciation of slurring that is Lazarus. Eleazar, Lazarus. Hello, I'm Eleazar. Lazarus, good to see you. <laughs> we even have in scriptural evidence that sometimes they shorten it to Laz. You can't tell me some of them weren't brothers at least. <laughs> <laughs> so as Kingfish said, where was I, Andy? <laughs> Seriously, work with me. I'm, I am, uh, I'm struggling this morning. Y'all should feel sorry for me. <laughs> but anyway, thank you. <laughs> These folks have mercy. They're merciful. <laughs> And so uh, Samuel said, well, no, you know, y'all do not want a king because a king is, gonna, is not going to do right by y'all. Folks said, no, we want a king, so please um, anoint Saul as our king. As I, so, that, so, so Saul was the first one anointed, the first Messiah. And uh, what was his role of, um, of Messiah? <laughs> we see it in 1 Samuel 10, 1 through 3. The Lord has anointed you ruler over his people Israel. You shall reign over the people of the Lord, and you will save them from the hand of their enemies all around. Wait a minute. It doesn't say anything about a Messiah as son of God. That's something different. That, that didn't apply to me. Messiah, the job of a Messiah is to protect the people from oppression. The concept of a Messiah grew that way. That's why Cyrus, who was not a Jew or Hebrew at all, he was called a Messiah why? Because he brought the people back from Babylon, um, back in, into Israel. He freed them. So he's called a Messiah. Um, uh, I, I, must, I must tell you, and this is something sort of upsetting. I'm writing a book about um, right-wing Christianity and Donald Trump. It's called Christians Against Christianity. And in reading for it, researching it, I came across some very disturbing stuff. And some of you have seen some of the, of the paper. I mean, one is people are saying, well, um, yeah, Trump is a piece of trash. He's this, he's that, he's bad, blah, blah, blah. But he's like Cyrus. He's Messiah like, a Messiah like Cyrus. Um, he's not, he's not a, a, doesn't have to be a man of faith. He just has to do things to free the people. Well, I don't know what they mean about free the people. And I don't want to hear them talk about, um, I mean, abortion's a terrible thing. And yes, let's talk about doing the things that need to be done um, to keep people from wanting to have abortions or needing to have abortions. That's very important. But it's also important to talk about what happens after they're born. And these folk, you don't hear them talk about that. They are willing to let the children's uh, health insurance program expire uh, because it serves some other interests that they have. And, but at the same time, they talk about all oh, their pro-life, they this, that, and the other. But then they want to go to war. They believe in capital punishment. Oh, it's, it's, it's madness. There are all kinds of prophecies that they're talking about, that, um, literal prophecies that they are extending to Donald Trump. 
Now, I mean, I have, well, these are things we have to talk about. And since it's not Sunday morning, I can say a little bit more than I would necessarily otherwise. So anyway, that's what a Messiah is. So Jesus was a Messiah. When he, so Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord has anointed me, has made me a Messiah to do what? To bring good news to the poor. What's good news to the poor? Well, it's not that they're going to become rich and some other folk that come after them might be poor. It's that the institutions and the relationships and the, the, the and the, the kinds of, of, uh, of economic relationships and arrangements that are the status quo at the time, that they will be changed. To say that blessed are, I mean, that I've come to bring good news to the poor is to say that I've come to upend oppressive and exploitive institutions and relationships. That's revolutionary to overturn oppressive institutions. That's like abolition, fighting to over, overturn institutions and laws that are oppressive. Jesus came to do that, he said, because he said that in the first line of his first sermon, that must be He's saying to us, this is an important responsibility of those who will follow me. He doesn't say, and when you read through the Gospels, he talks very little about what one should believe. He talks about all the time what we should do and how we should treat one another. His teachings are not theological in the uh, traditional sense, and they're certainly not, I mean, there are a few places where they're, uh, we can say that they're liturgical, well, they're used liturgically, like having to do with communion and the Lord's Prayer at times is used that way. But other than that, everything else he talks about is, 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 is really, one could say, it's ethical. Love your neighbor as yourself. Treat your neighbor this way. Do that. Do that the other. Do! When did that change? Well, it changed all oh, about the fourth century. This is a sad story. So with Jesus, you have the faith of the oppressed. You have folk going out um, willing to die to try to change things, leaving hearth and home, everything they knew, to go around the world not knowing they'll ever come back alive, trying to change the world. But it was in the fourth century. By that time, the, the faith started getting, started becoming domesticated, um, it started changing its tenor. Uh, we see, certainly we see that in the pastoral epistles like First and Second Timothy, where it talks about um, <coughs> treating the, the, the kings and the rulers with, as worthy of all honor. It even says, Christian slaves, treat your slave, your Christian slave master with all honor, which is crazy. Can you imagine Jesus saying something like that? Um, but this is, shows the decline. By the fourth century, we had a man named Constantine uh, who was entering into a war with Maximus, a general named Maximus. Brother knows I'm talking about. He's shaking his head. Thank you, brother. Um, both of them were vying to be the Caesar, to be the emperor. Personal aggrandizement. Well, Constantine claimed that he had a dream a night before. Well, he claimed he won. Constantine won the battle. He became Caesar, the emperor. He said the reason he won and what helped him win was that the night before, he would had a dream that said, uh, took the first two letter, Greek letters of, of Christ, um, Cairo, or C-R, I guess you would, uh, you would transliterate it and said, by this sign, you will conquer. So he had his men write those, write the, uh, the chi, rho, it looks like an X and a P, actually. But he had them write it on their tunics. And they went into the war, and they won. So as far as he's concerned, Christ was on his side and helped him win. So at that point, he decided that uh, he was going to work to institutionalize the faith under the aegis of 
the Roman Empire. And it was at that point that the faith of the oppressed began to be the religion of the oppressor. Eventually became the official religion of the same empire that had tortured Jesus to death. And Constantine declared himself the 13th apostle appointed by God, which meant that no one could question him. And he began to convene councils of, uh, of bishops and ministers to try to codify and come up with an, an orthodoxy of the faith. Um, and he was careful who he invited. He didn't invite everybody. Uh, he said they, he didn't invite, he called them persons of turbulent character, which meant, in other words, they didn't agree with him. It was also Constantine who turned the, the priesthood into a, a professional institution because he began to give these priests uh, stipends. Uh, but I'm, I'm sure that had nothing to do with the way they voted because what he would do was convene councils at which they would sit down and decide what was going to be the orthodox points of the faith. And they voted by hand. And they voted, for instance, they voted on, they will, the Father, Son, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Trinity, believing that that'll be a basic tenet of our faith. You must believe in the Holy Trinity. Now you can believe in it, there's nothing wrong with it, except nowhere does Jesus say that one must believe in the Holy Trinity. He, talks about the Father and the Son, but that's not what he does. He doesn't, he doesn't say this is important because Jesus wasn't that concerned about what folk believed. He was concerned with how they lived. And they came up with all these different, uh, all these different orthodoxies and all these points in these councils. And at that point, it became more important what you believed and subscribed to than what you do. And that exists to this day. You can be a Christian, seen as a Christian in good standing, and be some, one of the worst people on earth. I mean, we don't even have to name names. We know about that. We've seen them. Some of them we know personally. You know, Charles Manson said he was a Christian and had a cross on his forehead. Jesus talked about how your faith was uh, uh, your spirituality. This is how to describe spirituality. Love your Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. He didn't just say, love God, love God, uh, give an honor to God who's ahead of my life. He, that's, he didn't say that's enough. He said you also have to love your neighbor. You have to have the vertical and the horizontal because without both, you cannot have a cross. And so it's at that point that Christianity becomes less spiritual because spirituality, the only way you know what's spiritual is how people act in the world. And the most spiritual people are the most loving people, uh, the people who try their best to help their neighbor, uh, who are who those who really take the lesson of the Good Samaritan to heart. Those are the most spiritual people. Now, they might read the Bible once a year, but... Jesus didn't say, well, you are judged by how often you read the scripture. You're judged by how you act and how you live. We've lost that because now if you walk down the aisle, give your hand to the pastor and your heart to God, you're saved. And that's that. Um, and as long as you don't kill anybody or molest children, or steal from the church. Well, you can steal from the church and still be here. <laughs> don't, act like, don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Benny Hinn is worth $46 million. I'll leave that alone. Creflo, $30 million. But I think I'll leave that alone. I'm not going to call a roll. I don't have to. But I do have to tell you all this. <laughs> Just read the other day. K 
Kenneth Copeland was thanking the Lord for his new, what was a $30 million jet. He said, God gave it, God and you, I think, I'm thanking God and you, my parishioners, for this, uh, for this, this jet. And why is this jet important? Because the jet is for the, it's like a sanctuary uh, for the anointed. You don't have to go through all the demonic forces in the airport. I'm not kidding. And so they wheeled that new airport, airport uh, that new jet, I guess, to meet up with his, his other five or six jets on his own airfield. The man who had nowhere to lay his head. If Jesus had not ascended, he'd be rolling over in his grave. Well, anyway, let me move on. I want to get to, to Jesus. Let me, let me move on from there. So that's the Messiah. The purpose of the Messiah is to fight for, stand for, the oppression um, uh, against the oppression of the people. And there could be, a, and uh, there's a messianic role. One can fulfill that messianic role and not necessarily be an anointed uh, Messiah. Right? Martin Luther King fulfilled that role. I do believe he was anointed, um, but he was not officially anointed like that. And while I'm on it, I must just say to a thing, this word, the anointing, is just overused and used wrongly, and, and it's just, it's, it's really sad. Everything is anointed now, all right? If, it's, if, the, if the emotions are high, it's anointed. Um, really, right? Um, the anointing is in this place. Well, you mean because pastors worked everybody up? Because the emotions are high? Emotionality and spirituality is not the same thing. There is some, my old boy Benny Hinn was talking about uh, the anointing at one point. And he said, he said he and someone else went to visit the grave of some um, Christian contemporary Christian saint who had died, and he said that the anointing of the grave was so strong that it was blowing us away. We had to grab a pole to keep it from blowing us away. I'm, I'm not kidding. I'm not, not exaggerating. That's true. And so that's a term that, we, that, that we, has become so cheapened that it almost is meaningless now. Well, we have to try to reappropriate it and try to set it straight. And then, you don't have to be nasty, but when we hear people say, oh, the anointing is there, ask me, okay, what exactly do you mean? And many folk won't be able to answer. They say, well, you know, everybody was this, that. Well, does that mean that it was anointed? Eventually, you, know, you don't, have to, don't have to make people mad, but we must raise the question, why? Because our faith is going downhill, it's being denigrated, and we can't let it go that easily. Um, when Jesus was the anointed Messiah, we can't have folk talking about, um, <coughs> talking about uh, a room is anointed. <laughs> or a jet is anointed. <laughs> Boy, if I could get my hands on one of them jokers, I swear, I would, <laughs> I'd have to ask forgiveness. The next important point, uh, historical epic that Jesus also had reference to, was uh, the period of the prophets. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the period of the prophets, but it's just a couple definitions. We talk about biblical prophecy. A lot of people think that it's the kind of secular uh, prophecy that means just foretelling the future. No, it's, that's part of it, but it's the secondary part. The first part is speaking truth to power, foretelling. Telling folk what they're doing wrong, you're oppressing people, you're cheating people, you're killing people, that's, that's uh, foretelling, forthtelling. Then you have foretelling. Foretelling is, but, and if you don't stop, the law's going to get you. That is what prophecy is about. Prophecy is a challenge to the powers that be. When you read through the, through the prophets, 
That is what they're, they're doing. They're, they're fighting against uh, unjust social structures, mostly economic structures. Of course, Jesus, as we know, um, he embodies that, uh, that prof prophetic sensibility. In fact, uh, I think the Gospel of Luke calls Jesus a prophet, mighty in word uh, and deed. We move on from that period. Uh, and what I'm showing you as we go through is that every major period uh, of uh, the periodization of uh, what became Judaism, every major period at its foundation was about power and liberation, and um, it was political in that sense. From there, we move on to the exile, when the uh, Judahites were kidnapped by the, uh, the Babylonians and taken to Babylon, where they stayed for a century or so. Um, and they didn't take everybody. They took the elite, right? They took the merchants, they took the priests, those folk who, you know, uh, the best educated. So these folk went to Babylon and uh, going from rural, how can I put it, not particularly cosmopolitan Israel um, to Babylon it was like going from Farmville, Virginia, my home to New York City. I know because I've done both, right? And you see what I'm saying? So they, folk move from the country and they go to the city. All of a sudden, y'all, it's country. They become sophisticated, right? Yeah, everybody else is, is, is country. And, and this is it's interesting because when you read uh, the, exilic, uh, the exil exilic Psalms and books, name exilic books for me, uh, Esther. Mostly Esther, but in the Psalms, you see those exilic Psalms. They're talking about going home, and, and they're uh, uh, talking about how much they miss home, but they're acting like there's nobody there. You read them, it's like everybody's gone. Of course, you know, the most important people are gone, we're gone, so nobody's there. Those poor folk don't count. But we have evidence that there, that there, were, that there was worship in the a destroyed temple during the time that uh, they were gone. Anyway, after about 100 years, I guess it was 80 to 100 years or so, um, the Persians vanquished the Babylonians. And S Cyrus, the Persian emperor, um, relocated the people, repatriated them back to Judah. Why? Because he was a good guy? Because he felt sorry for him? That's not exactly the, what moved emperors. And apparently, he brought, he, he brought them back after becoming uh, more sophisticated and, and more used to bureaucracy, brought them back to the frontier of Israel to uh, help manage uh, the interests of the empire. And what's significant is at this point, it's here when the high priesthood begins. We have it mentioned you know, earlier in the Bible, but as an institution, this is where it be begins. How? It doesn't grow organically from the religion of the people. The first high priest in the priesthood is instituted by the emperor, the Persian emperor. The priest worked for an answer to the emperor, the high priest. And that was the beginning of uh, what culminated in the priestly aristocracy in, in Jesus' time. But what's significant is that the high priest of the religion of the people was answerable ultimately to the oppressor of the people. And Josephus, our major uh, witness from uh, antiquity uh, tells us that the high priest held sacrifices in the temple every day from then up until when the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. He held sacrifices for the health and the welfare of the emperor every day. 
Now, I mean, think about that. So what does it tell us? Well, the high priest wasn't, his main concern was not the everyday people. And that gives us a sense. That's why when you see that the priest was so against Jesus, um, and he was so against the priest, it wasn't so much a, a religious thing, it was a political thing, a class thing, because the priest <clears throat> evolved into, a, <clears throat> into a, a class that itself exploited the people and often cooled them out so they would not stand up against their oppressors. God don't, don't want you to do that. God says, just wait on him. And, but man, they're killing our babies. Yeah, but the Lord won't put nothing on you more than you can bear, <laughs> which is not in the Bible, by the way. So anyway, <laughs> and there's a lot more to that, but I, I will leave that alone. Uh, so what we see, though, is that we have a class cleavage between what we call the, the little people, the little tradition, uh, and the great tradition, the dominationist strand and the uh, resistance strand of the everyday people, the everyday peasantry, uh, over against the, uh, the priests and the priestly aristocracy um, who, who exploited them through the temples, through the temple, through, uh, uh, through, through tithes and extensive, extensive uh, taxation. Um, I'm going to skip over the Maccabean period. And I just want to go from here. And let me say, I, I meant to say it first. If you have a question about something that I've said, feel free to raise your hand. You don't have to wait till the end. Now, if I don't respond to you, it's because I'm in the middle of a thought and I don't want to, to, to lose it. But I just want you all to feel free because everybody's not going to remember all their questions at the end, and maybe I won't remember everything I said. <laughs> all right. So all this is before Jesus. Then we come to the time of Jesus. Oh, yeah, and that was silent night, holy night, all as calm as bright, wasn't it? <laughs> no. It was not. It was more like Inner city blues make me want to holler the way they treat my life. <laughs> so in Jesus' uh, time, we had political, economic, and social conditions. And Jesus' ministry was in response to the needs of the people. And let me, I think the way I'm going to deal with it, I'm going to change things. I am going to talk about this through the prism of the Lord's Prayer as opposed to going, um, treating the subjects separately. So, when we look at the Gospel of Luke and, and uh, the Gospel of, of uh, Matthew, Luke tells us that Jesus' disciples ask them asked him to teach them how to pray like John's disciples. Now, did it mean they didn't know how to pray? I mean, if no one else knew how to pray, Jews knew how to pray. And we can go down the line, go to Deuteronomy 6, which says to pray three times a day. Um, all the table blessings and uh, thanksgiving um, prayers and liturgies. I mean, they knew how to pray. So what were they saying? Well, when they said, teach us how to pray, as John taught his disciples how to pray, disciple meaning student, he, he's saying, tell us what we should be concerned about. What should be the main uh, point, emphasis of our, of our spiritual ministration? What should we dedicate ourselves to uh, spiritually and holistically um, in, in the world. So when we pray to God, what should we ask for power to do? And what should we ask for power to be changed? And he said to them, when you pray, pray like this. By the way, essentially said, um, don't act like a fool. And you know, be serious, be serious about this thing. I mention that because 
Prayer sometimes seems like it's a performance. And it's not always or even mainly the fault of the person who's doing it. It's that we expect a performance. So if someone gets up and does a sincere prayer uh, without uh, all of uh, the traditional touchstones that we are used to, folks say, man, that Negro can't pray at all. <laughs> I know none of y'all ever thought that. I know that. But I'm talking about other people uh, outside. When you pray, pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Our Father. He didn't say Father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He didn't say my, pray my Father. Pray our Father. You pray for the collective. You pray for the people. The concern must be for the people. There is no word for individual in Hebrew, is there? No. Pray for the people. Our Father, that means we are, are to be seen as one people. No big eyes, little U's. Our concern must be for the uplifting and the justice, uh, the just conditions for all people to live under. Our Father. It's not, it can be personal, but it ain't just private. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now, we're starting to get into the political in a sense because in the Roman Empire, whose name is supposed to be hallowed under Roman civil religion? Caesar. When you say, hallowed be your name, God, it's like saying, no, man, we're not going to hallow Caesar's name, which is a major offense. <clears throat> you might even be able to get crucified for that as a, a seditionist. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Politics again, why? Because Caesar's kingdom is already here. And to ask for God's, to, to bring God's kingdom of justice is to say, we want Caesar's kingdom gone by hook or by crook. We want it overturned. We want it out of here. Now, why? Why are the people so upset about it? Well, they, Jesus' people were, <clears throat> they were subjects, they were colonial subjects, subjects of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was brutal. And the way the Roman Empire conducted itself, pardon me, <clears throat> the way that the Roman Empire conducted itself and treated the people was like the Dred Scott decision. No rights that a Jew had no rights that a Roman need respect. And so Howard Thurman said what that means is that if somebody came and pushed Jesus in the ditch, he'd just be a Jew in a ditch. It was a very, very uh, time of, of terrible exploitation. In fact, when Jesus was born, oh, about four years before that, four years or so before that, I guess, um, there's a town called Sepphoris, which is, was like a half day's walk from Nazareth. Nazareth was... Well, it wasn't much happening in Nazareth. Uh, Sepphoris was a, um, ha had been started by the Romans. And so it was, it, it was a, a, a well-to-do town. And so they thought they had a little extra special juice. So when taxes were raised, they raised a ruckus, and they raised a fuss, and they demonstrated. And Caesar wanted folk to know that he wasn't playing, so he sent his soldiers in, and they slew all kinds of folk. Those they did not slay, 
they crucified along the road between Nazareth and Sepphoris. And the people of Nazareth worked in Sepphoris, uh, many of them, because they were working on the magnificent buildings there. And they were crucified. Josephus tells us something like 20 or 30,000, but he's exaggerating. Let's say there were only 200 people crucified along the road. Or let's say there was only 20 people crucified along the road. There weren't that many people in Nazareth, a couple hundred people. So imagine, we remember the horror and the revulsion <coughs> and the pang of fear, those of us who were alive at that time, that when we saw the picture of Emmett Till the first time, 20 million black folk, <coughs> and we're, and, we have, <coughs> pardon me. <coughs> we, um, <coughs> now what is it the devil don't want me to talk about? Um, <laughs> I must be honest, I don't believe in a devil as such. But that's really not your business, so I shouldn't have said it. All right. <coughs> You have 20, so let's say you have 20 people impaled on crosses along that road. And it, the Romans would not let anyone take them down, take their bodies down. Now, some of those people lived for a very long time. Jesus' death of the cross was mercifully short. And that's possibly because they had beaten him so badly and mistreated him so badly. But folk could live for days on the cross in agony urinating and defecating and screaming and moaning and then when they died you couldn't take their bodies down so you have the stench wafting into Nazareth from all these people and the horror so just as I mentioned Emmett Till just now imagine a little village who saw all this horror just a little ways ago imagine how that just permeated their consciousness and so when Jesus was born, just a few years later, folks still were traumatized, and they were still talking about it if they were people just like us. And they still had this terrible fear that it might happen to them. So Jesus was born in this setting of, of, of fear and trepidation of the worst kinds of oppression. So <clears throat> when he talks about your kingdom come, God, well, that's one of the reasons why. Because God's kingdom would be about justice. Caesar's is not. If Caesar's kingdom was doing right, the prayer would be, God, keep Caesar going. All right? But no, it's a replacement. So that gives a sense of the, of the political atmosphere that Jesus uh, came up in. There, there's so much more to it. I can't spend it all today. But I, I did talk about it in the book that you um, neglected to mention. That is the politics of Jesus. The politics of Jesus. And I might say this, and I, you know, I don't have to try to build it up. This book's been out for, what, 10 years. And they did a, uh, a major panel at the American Academy of Religion to commemorate its 10-year anniversary. Um, and so it's not like I'm out here trying to hawk my book. But I recommend that you buy The Hot Politics of Jesus. Why? because I put my heart and soul in it to give us the kind of things we need on the ground. And it has come to be sort of a, uh, uh, not what you might call it, sort of a contemporary classic in a sense. And it's been called, you know, the most influential book of, uh, in, the, in New Testament studies in quite some time. And, and that's why you should read it, not because I wrote it. Actually, I don't, can't really say I wrote it. Some things come through us and not from us. I was rereading it recently. I was saying, Dad, whoever wrote this was smart. <laughs> I wish it was me. <laughs> also during this time, this, uh, this, this oppression was so bad that w you've heard of Franz Fanon, some of you. He wrote The Wretched of the Earth and, and other books. The Wretched of the Earth is, is his signal book, though, and uh, in the Appendix C, in the back of the book, the end of the book, 
he lists what he calls reactionary psychoses to oppression. In other words, psychotic reactions to oppression. Um, he was from Martinique, but he worked for the French military um, in their occupation of Algeria. And uh, he was a psychiatrist. And uh, his job was to treat the soldiers, but also to treat, um, give therapy to some of the, um, the Algerian prisoners and some of the what they call crazy people in the street. Um, and uh, one of the features of the, the French war, the Algerian war of uh, liberation from the French, is that the French used torture as an everyday tool and policy. They, I mean, it's not like, well, eventually, if things don't work out, we're going to torture you. Torture, they went to torture first. And they destroyed many people's minds. Well, <clears throat> for no one, uh, he recounts in his reactionary psychoses. When he talks about these people's uh, reactionary, uh, psychotic, and pathological reactions to colonial oppression, when you read it, you say, it, it's, well, let me tell you what he, he says. The first thing that happens, he says, in a setting of brutal colonialization. First thing that happens to the colonial subject in the society is that women's menstrual cycles are, uh, are disturbed. Don't we see that in the gospel? More than once? He said the tension and the fear. That's the first thing this disruption of menstrual cycles. He said, then also, you, you next you see historical lameness. Now, we, call, we know there are physiological reasons for lameness quite a bit, but there's also historic, uh, hysterical lameness, uh, where folk are afraid to fight or afraid uh, to be a, a target. And so, psychologically, they just become lame. They can't. So, that, so they aren't a threat anymore. Doesn't mean they're playing. Their mind has taken them there. Uh, that is why we see Jesus healing some lame people. Uh, some of them could you know, have phys physiological lameness, but some of them, he is, <clears throat> he is alleviating this, this psychological pathology that, that has permeated their consciousness and really through their, through their body and brought them through. And that's important uh, uh, to remember. But he said the second thing you'll see is historical lameness. And when we see lameness throughout the Gospels, and we're talking about a relatively uh, short number of, uh, of pages, and we see it prominently displayed. You think about it, how many times we see that in these stories. And then he says something that's very important. He, he mentioned um, that another thing he noticed was masochistic episodes. And he gives a story, he related the story of a young man who was self-hating, masochistic, he was out, uh, he was harming himself. He hated himself. Um, he was screaming. He was just out there. And Fanon, they brought him to be treated by Fanon. And after some time and many sessions of therapy, Fanon realized, and the young man realized that what, why he was acting that way was because he was, his, his self-hatred was such that he hated him, himself because he was unable to protect his people. And that brings to, to mind the fifth chapter of Mark, doesn't it? The Gerizim demoniac, who's throwing himself on the rocks, hollering, screaming, cutting himself. And they say that he has an unclean spirit in him. Now, some people say that's a, a demon. 
could be, but an unclean spirit is not necessarily that, a demon. But anyway, Jesus is called, and uh, Jesus looks at the man and said, uh, he realizes an unclean spirit in him, so he called the unclean spirit out and said, who are you? Name yourself. And he said, our name is Legion, for we are many. Please do not send us out of the country. Now, he didn't say, please don't send us out of the man. He said, don't send us out of the country. And his name was Legion. So what collective entity was in Israel that called itself Legion? It's the Roman Legion. So this young man represents, uh, he, he rep, he's a representative figure of the, of the pathology that people are experiencing. But what it really says, it's telling us that the cause of, some, of, of uh, so much of this pathology, of, of this lameness, of the, the so-called insanity, so-called demon possession, was the oppression, the occupation by the Roman military in Israel. The political situation wasn't silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright. I mean, we're talking about some terrible stuff these people experience. And uh, do we have a, uh, a frame of reference? Well, yes, we do. Because these people were, were, were treated as badly as our people were <clears throat> some time ago. And unfortunately, there's still some places where they're still treated that badly. So this. King James stuff, where people are talking all of this stuff, trying to make it seem like it's something else. No, 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 no. This is a terrible situation with people just like us. And that is why Jesus said to pray for God's kingdom come. God's will be done. God's kingdom was a kingdom of, gut, of justice. God's kingdom was uh, said that the, the, the sole sovereignty is God's. There will not be any any domin dominators ruling over the people. That should be told to some folk who ran for president to rule, not to serve, yeah. but to rule. I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to get away from that because he got to go. Yeah. How long are we going? Let's take a couple questions now, have a break, and we'll come back. Is that correct? And I'm going to tell you, the law is going to be mad if you'll leave. Um, how do I know? I'm not going to say it. I better not. That's not. No, do we have any questions? Uh, there's a microphone. Please step to the microphone so everybody can hear the questions. Yes, sir. You talked about earlier that Jesus was concerned more concerned with people did, but don't people act on what they believe in the long run? I mean, how you believe de de depends to determine your behavior over a long period. Is that not correct? Well, yeah, when I said believe, I'm talking about uh, liturgical beliefs, orthodox beliefs, right? Uh, let's take uh, Mahatma Gandhi. He never confessed Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. He said he loved Jesus. He said he hadn't, didn't have any use for Christians. But he loved Jesus because he said Christians didn't, didn't follow Jesus in his world. But you take him. He never, he never confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and as Savior. But you look at him, there are few people in history who have lived as Christ-like as he has. So when I say about beliefs, I'm talking about you know, orthodox beliefs. Uh, you must confess this. You must confess that. You must confess uh, the other. I'm not saying that's... Uh, not important. I'm saying that that's not foundational. It's, it, 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 um, it's not determinative of, of, of anything in the long run unless, as you said, we, 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 we live it. I'm, I'm also going to say that there are, some, there are some points of orthodoxy that it doesn't matter where you, whether you believe them or not in the, in the long run. I, I won't get into any of them because that take us a field and might be controversial. But think about some of those things. If you don't believe in it, it doesn't mean you don't believe in God, right? right? One of the biggest fights they had was uh, whether God was of 
a similar, where Jesus was of a similar substance of God or of the same substance of God. I mean, this was major. People were killed and in prison and all that kind. I'm like, it was Jesus, man. I mean, so what? Let's not focus on that. So you see what I'm saying? That's what, what, I'm, what I'm referring to. Yes, sir. You chose Luke. You didn't choose Matthew and Mark. Why? The reason I ask you that is because in Matthew and Mark, it's an apocalyptic first message. Whereas in Luke, it's the, the Spirit of the Lord message. And Luke, of course, writes you know, a little later. Why did, you know, wh uh, do you choose Luke because Luke serves where you are as an author? Or do you, I guess what I'm really saying is, why the choice of Luke yeah, rather question. than the earlier work where he's an ap apocalyptic preacher, the Spirit of the Lord is about me, that's yeah. later on. But the first one is repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, which is more apocalyptic. Why do you choose the Luke and, rather than Mark and in the uh, Matthew? Yeah, good point. Well, as I said, Luke, what Luke portrays as Jesus' first sermon, why is that significant? Well, we're told that Jesus, Luke tells us Jesus was baptized. And instead of going out and he's going to be the big time preacher, he, he realized that he had to go to prepare himself totally for his ministry. So he went out into the desert, right? And he, uh, he prepared himself with spiritual disciplines of fasting, right? And silence, solitude, contemplation, um, controlling his ego. And it was only then, after he'd gone through all that, and empowered himself and prepared himself is only then when he stood up and said who he was. So when I give uh, reference, I give reference to the Gospel of Luke uh, for that because that is a manifesto and a proclamation um, which was really so radical that they wanted to kill him for it. Now, when you have um, uh, Jesus. Um, preaching the same thing that John the Baptist did, you know, re repent for the kingdom of, of uh, that's not really a sermon. That is a proclamation, right? But that's, that's why, sir. Uh, other questions? By the way, that was a, a very good question. And for a minute you had me when you said apocalyptic. I'm saying, which one is he talking about? <laughs> I know what apocalyptic mean, but. Hello. There we go. I wanted to revisit um, your statements about anointing. What is your about what? anointing? Uh -huh. So, what is your definition of anointed, and what does that look like today? Well, I, I don't know that my definition really matters. I'll, get, I'll deal with the biblical okay. uh, definition. In the Bible, um, there was a limit, limited uh, uses of anointing. At times, we saw priests anointed. We saw messiahs anointed, maybe a king or so. Um, and liturgical vessels were anointed. Um, nowhere do we see anointing used like it's used today as a catch-all for, well, for all kinds of, kinds of things. So that's the biblical definition as I, under, as I understand it. My personal definition is essentially that. You know, I don't have any, any problem. In fact, look, I, I grew up in the Baptist church, man. <laughs> Me and my sisters, like, we thought we were born in the Sunday school room, man. We were there so early. <laughs> and, you know, I, I mean, ecstatic worship. I mean, people are moved to heights of ecstasy. And sometimes we um, <clears throat> folk really are, sometimes it's, it's cathartic. You suffer all week, you get it out. There was a woman in the church I remember, she would cry like a baby every week, scream and, and cry every week. Well, she was suffering. She was letting that out. That's important too. It's very important. So I'm not knocking a spirit-filled spirit, spirit uh, worship. I mean, spirit-filled worship and spirit-ted worship are not necessarily the same time. 
you know. I mean, there's Spirit Ted rock and roll, you know, so you can. But um, <laughs> anyway, I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Question, uh, why did you skip over the Maccabean period? And would you recommend black Americans to read about that period? Good question, good question. Well, I did it for brevity's sake, but um, I'm gonna come back to that, brother. I'm gonna answer uh, your question, and then I like the whole questions for a minute and so, I can, so I can deal with the, uh, Maccabee, because I don't wanna keep this brother standing up, okay? Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Um, first of all, thank you for all your work and witness around the world. Um, your book is excellent. Thank you. Um, I had just heard a sermon by Reverend Dr. Um, Edward Carter Sr. at um, Morehouse, and um, he did a sermon entitled Other Sheep I Have, and he talked about the Good Samaritan. And I just but I need to, you to speak I'm a sorry. Louder Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. That's My better. lip is like on the. Oh, okay, that's good. Okay. <laughs> I apologize for that. Um, I said. Um, I forgive you, my son. <laughs> But yeah, I just want to say thank you for all your working with us around the world. And I also wanted to say that I heard a sermon by Reverend Dr. Uh, Edward Carter Sr. at Morehouse Theological, <coughs> Morehouse um, Martin Luther King Jr. Um, International Chapel. Um, and last year he did a sermon on the topic, Other Sheep I Have. He talked about people of other faiths, including Mahatma Gandhi. And then he also referenced the book by, by um, Victor Frankl, um, where Victor Frankl actually talked about the, the um, the deficits of interpreting education in the, in, the, in the wrong way. And I just wanted to ask your opinion um, on mass incarceration. Um, too many people are too quiet about people that look like me and that are following our education and are being demonized constantly on social media, on CNN, on Fox, on whatever you want to watch, whatever you want to listen to, and I just wanted to ask your opinion, your thought, your perspective on the sociological and psychological aspect on the prison, the prison industrial complex and the prison pipeline for young black men and young black women around the world. Okay, all right, well that's a very, very important question. By the way, after the break, I'm going to come back to the Lord's Prayer, um, and it becomes more juicy as we go along. Um, I know that as children, we've been taught the Lord's Prayer was we just say it wrote, um, but it's really one of the most revolutionary pronouncements in antiquity when it's understood correctly. So, young man, and uh, with regard to what you say, in Jesus, um, what Luke presents as Jesus' initial sermon, uh, he also talks about he sent to um, free uh, those who are in prison. And now, <clears throat> there's some implications of that. Was Jesus saying? Uh, let everybody out, even serial murderers, and go out and do whatever they want. No, we saw now there was a lot of injustice. There was a lot of unjust, a lot of people were incarcerated unjustly. And so that is um, one biblical critique you can point right to as a reference. Um, the prison industrial complex do you know that private prisons have made more money than ever since Donald Trump got into office? They are a function of capitalism, something we don't talk about, and we should. Martin Luther King, he was talking about it from the time he was a very young man, barely 20. And if I might say in this sermon, uh, Paul's letter to, the American, to American Christians, he, he writes this sermon uh, in the epistolary voice of Paul, he says, um, and I understand you have something called capitalism. And he talks about how uh, deleterious capitalism is, how, how it, uh, it destroys some folks, it exploits folks, how it, it, its inevitable resort, result is income inequality, how those who have the most capital, the most money, are, the, are those that rule how cap uh, capitalism is not compatible with democracy because whoever has the most capital can influence and control the most votes. So it's not one person, one vote. So I'm saying all that, all that to say that um, when we talk about egalitarian justice, 
um, and, and the importance of working to institute it, it means we also have to be in dialogue about the political economy, the capitalist political economy. Um, and with the prison industrial complex, that's part of it. It's what they call neo-capitalism, in which they, um, they make everything a profit center. Everything. They even sell organs now, body organs now. Uh, so that's the short answer, brother. The other thing, we know that it's unjust. Um, and the, the system's going to be unjust as long as white supremacy is allowed to reign the way that it does. Moreover, there are many folk, um, black folk, many poor folk, who are, af are afraid to really question prisons. Give me an example. Richard Pryor said that when he went to, some of y'all know this story, he said he, he visited, he spoke out of jail, you know, did his thing in a jail, and then he was talking to some of the brothers. So he said, uh, but brother, why you kill everybody in the whole, everybody in the house, man? He said, well, they was home. <laughs> See, some people, and Richard Pryor said, man, I, so I'm glad there's prisons, what he said. And there are people who respond that way. Uh, you have other folk who see prisons, when they, when they see prisons, they see a repository of black folk, yeah. right? So we have all these forces uh, to, to fight. Um, Angela Davis is a good friend of mine. Angela is, has been standing against, she's been talking about abolishing uh, prisons for years. Um, she doesn't know exactly what that would mean, but we, you know, also mean you have to start moving in, 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 in some way. Um, prisons are not natural when you think about it. Um, you look at some of the Scandinavian countries, they don't put people in cages like that. That's horrible. Um, they, they can find them, but they can find them in, in decent places. Some of them have their own little kitchenette, you know, uh, to, so they can feel like human beings. So they don't grow up with, with rage. They're kept away from folk. But it depends if, if the point of a prison is to, uh, is to help someone grow, become a better human being, then give some conditions where it can happen. But the point of our prison is to punish people and punish black folks, really. That's what the whole thing is about. So it's very complex, um, but we have to talk about it. And I, the, talking in terms of ab prison abolition, I think that's not the good way to talk about it. But to talk about prison reform or prisons becoming bastions of justice and growth, humane growth, I think that's another way. And that's something the church really must be involved in. And going in the church in, with church ministry is important and, and very much, but that's not enough. That's not enough. Too many people are in jail. They shouldn't be there, or they're there doing their time, and they're brutalized in ways that they don't deserve. Um, so yeah, brother, that's, that's an important point. We must be uh, sensitive to that. Quickly about Maccabee, Maccabean, um, that Maccabean revolt. In about 163 BC, thereabouts, There was a man named uh, uh, Antiochus, who was the descendant of one of the generals of Alexander the Great. When Alexander the Great died real young after he had conquered all this land, so his generals, there were 12 of them, I think they were, who um, divided his empire among themselves. And uh, one, um, Antiochus was Seleucus, yeah, he was um, a descendant of, of a general called, named Seleucus. And um, he became the ruler of Palestine, Syria. And he, I don't know how he wore his hair, but he acted like, sort of like folk that, you know, are in the news today. Um, Antiochus, decided that he wanted to crush the Jewish religion. He didn't want to crush Islam. He wanted to crush the Jewish religion. And so he made an edict that everybody had to um, swear fealty to his god, Zeus, and that he would send his soldiers to every town and every village 
to make sure that the people um, make <coughs> profess loyalty and fealty to Zeus. And he would make them he would make them show that, prove that by slaughtering a pig on their altar, their sacred altar. And we know about the kosher laws, and that's so they came to one village, a village called Modin, I believe it is, and it's in the hills, not 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 a, a long distance from Jerusalem, but anyway, Romans rode in, they uh, lined the men up and said that, uh, told them what to do, you have to sacrifice and give your loyalty to Zeus. And so there was a man named Mattathias, he had five sons. And uh, so the Roman, uh, the Roman commander said, told the men to come forward and no one moved. And he said, come forward and do the sacrifice or you will be killed. We will kill you. Well, in, in the back, Mattathias said, all right, but if you do it, I'm going to kill you. And as Richard Pryor would say, then it was on. <laughs> he and his five sons, um, they started a fight. And they defeated the Roman, uh, that, that uh, cadre of Roman soldiers right there at that time. Um, and eventually, this peasant re rebellion uh, defeated the, the Greek army, which had been you know, drilled and for, for centuries. And uh, so they were seen as liberators in Israel. And, and Hanukkah comes out of that because um, Hanukkah's a commemoration when they, when they freed the temple and uh, they were able to, to uh, worship in the temple according to the way they wanted to. Um, but what's important about Macca uh, Maccabean period because these were heroes, liberators that were rem remembered by the people all through <coughs> Through, the, through the, the decades and the centuries. And how do we know? Because the leader of the Maccabean Rebellion came to be uh, Judah, Judas. Right. Mattathias' name was Matthew. How do we know? Because children were named after them almost as a rule of thumb. There were all kinds of James and Judases, right? All kinds of Matthews. We look at Jesus' disciples. He had some in there. Um, the, so the, the period of the Maccabees was important because the Maccabees were liberators, and they, they brought a, a tradition of liberation, and people remembered that uh, every year when they, when they celebrated uh, Hanukkah, when they began to celebrate Hanukkah. So that's what the Maccabean re re rebellion was. And the significance is that Jesus' consciousness of the liberation uh, dimension of it, not only his, but the culture's uh, uh, consciousness of it, is reflected in the fact that their names, that people name their children after them. Just like I have a, a friend, uh, uh, Reverend Buster Soares, I've known since high school. He has twin sons. One is named Malcolm, one is named Martin. I mean, it's just the same thing, understand? Well, look, as I'm told, we should take a short break here. Well, folks, we praise God for this time together. We also praise God when folk, I praise God when folk listen to me a little bit. <laughs> to paraphrase my friend Richard Pryor again, much as I done messed up in life, I'm glad anybody listened to me. And y'all don't need to know what that was either. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> Still speaking of, of, of uh, political dimension of conditions of Jesus and those things that, pardon me, what about it? Huh? How's this? Well, mm, Lord. <laughs> A 
Eddie Kendrick, look out. Um, one other, I guess we call uh, political contradiction in uh, Jesus' setting, had to do with the priests. Um, we're not going to spend a lot of time on the priests, other than to say that the priests, time of Jesus, they had become an aristocracy, um, a, a rich ruling class. And, <clears throat> pardon me, and their riches came. The riches came from the peasants. Riches came from the people. Riches came from um, <clears throat> the tithes and offerings that the priests got a portion of in the temple. Uh, the priests were very, very rich. When uh, <clears throat> you look at the models of the old city in Jerusalem, and one sees that, <coughs> pardon me, one sees that there was a priestly quarter where the priests lived. And what's the nicest neighborhood in this area, or the richest one anyway? Whatever it was, that's what the priest's neighbor was like. That was the richest neighborhood, right? And give an idea who the priests thought they were. They had a bridge built over the street from their neighborhood directly into the temple so they wouldn't have to walk through the streets with the everyday people. <laughs> that is to say, if they were alive today, they'd have a jet as a sanctuary of the <laughs> anointing. I mean, it's a significant analogy, I think. Um, <clears throat> we also, we don't see the priests in the Gospels. In the Gospels, the priests are not ref reflected as being out among the people, except when they're out to challenge somebody or to, st or to start something. Um, <clears throat> mm. I think I will do this. Yes, yes, yes. Um, the priest, there is something I, I would call a priestly ideology. Uh, a priestly ideology. Now, now there is. Um, pastoral role, shepherd's role. There is a prophetic role to be played, which is to stand up uh, for the people, protect and look out for the least of these. And then there's a priestly role, um, I want to be careful with this. There's a priestly role that is <clears throat> sort of based on a class ideology uh, priests represent a class, a professional class, and they have things set up, and priesthoods always have mechanisms set up um, by which they can, uh, which I won't say siphon off the, the wealth of the people, but which at least they can get a good share of it. Right. In uh, Jesus' time, the priests were uh, we're no different. And at times, they could be quite rapacious. Um, we're told that, that the people, after a certain point, at one point, people were, were uh, having problems. Uh, well, for what, one reason or another, they weren't bringing their full tithes and offerings. The priests were supposed to get 10%. Uh, which was their time. And so um, the people would take their wheat to the threshing floor and then take it home and use it for bread or whatever. And, uh, and, and from there they would, they would donate it to the temple, pay their tithe with it. When people stopped paying uh, regularly enough, the priests started sending their servants to the threshing floor to take their tithe. And this gives some sense of, of uh, for those folks where they didn't have, you know, they didn't have TVs and stuff like that where they could get people's money. Um, so they did they did things uh, they did things that way. <clears throat> and we see Jesus really had a problem with this temple ideology because it did not. 
because it did not serve the people. Um, we see in uh, uh, Jeremiah 11, is it Jeremiah 11 or Jeremiah 20? We see in Jeremiah, anyway, that uh, we're told that Shiloh was destroyed. Judy, what is the first line of, it's Jeremiah 20. <coughs> no, I, I want 11. May I, may I use that? I'll, I'll read it aloud. Thank you. All right. Jeremiah 7, yes. Um, <clears throat> the cleansing of the temple. Now, whew, Jeremiah 7 is rough, boy. <clears throat> cleansing of the temple. Now, that's a, uh, that's a term we've used to describe it. That's our descriptive term. But... <clears throat> It also, we must also realize that it was not just cleansing of the temple, it was a demonstration set in the temple, occupation of the temple. Right. And why? Well, we're told that they did it, Jesus uh, did it because he, uh, because the money changers were uh, overcharging people and uh, he didn't like that, of course, and so he, uh, reacted to it. Um, but the money changers played an important role. They were there because they had to exchange, they would exchange uh, prof Roman prof profane coinage for uh, Jewish shekels, so it was only, no profane uh, coinage was to go into the uh, temple treasury. So, I mean, Jesus wasn't, wasn't mad at uh, money changers because they were, they were there. More, more importantly, though, as we will see, what he really was concerned about was the temple apparatus, the economic apparatus, the way that they uh, destroyed people, exploited people, but also the way they deluded people, All right? So as we read through it, I'll, I'll, I'll go to Mark, uh, Mark 17. Mark 15, they came to Jerusalem, uh, excuse me, 11, 15. And they came, to, yeah, there is no Mark 17. Okay. And they came to Jerusalem, they entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he taught and said to them, is it not written in my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it, heard it and sought a way to destroy him, for they feared him, because all the multitude was astonished at his teaching. Astonished is not the best translation. I think it's more like moved or even frightened is, is not the best word, but it's, it's not just they were sitting there amazed. No, they, were, they had a, a visceral reaction to it. Now, why is this significant? Well, a couple things we're told here. That he went through the temple and overturned the tables of money changers. Those who sold pigeons for sacrifice. We're not told that anybody stopped him. I submit to you that if I went through one pew <laughs> trying to throw your stuff on the floor that I would not make it. <laughs> now imagine a man who's going to, one man who's going to go into the temple and turn all those money, I mean this is money, we're not just talking about books on your lap, 
turn money ta uh, changes tables over, go through the, and, and nothing happens to him, he doesn't get arrested, nothing that, what does that say to you? Well, well, a couple things. One, either we had violence or the threat of violence, number one. Number two, that he was not alone. He went and he overturned, and he was angry. He overturned the, the, the money changes and said they turned uh, it into a, de a den of, of robbers, um, house of prayer into a den of robbers. And um, <clears throat> if we turn to Jeremiah 7, it gives us a little sense. Then the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Uh, came to Jeremiah, the word came from, that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim this word and say, hear the word of the Lord, all you people of Judah, you that enter these gates to worship the Lord. Okay. See, I'm not the Old Testament scholar. That's, uh... okay, here we are. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Do not trust in these deceptive words. This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. We talk about the house of the Lord, you know. There is no house of the Lord. The Lord is not supposed to have a house, right? Um, and, and folk hide behind that. This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. You shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. He's saying, no, that, that is not adequate uh, for supporting the things that you want to do. And then he goes on to say, Lord, if you truly amend your ways and your doings, if you truly act justly one with another if you do not oppress the alien, the orphan, and the widow, or shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not go after other gods to your own hurt, then I will dwell with you in this place, in the land that I gave of old to your ancestors forever and ever. And then it goes on, and, and I won't read through the whole thing, um, other than to say that this is explaining, uh, as it does in the, in the uh, 11th verse onward, um, how when you turn a, a, a house into a den, of, a, a house of prayer into a den of robbers, that what is supposed to happen is what is, happened in Shiloh, that it was destroyed and it was brought low. And we see Jesus talk about that in many places, how the temple would be destroyed, right? So why is Jesus so upset? Well, before we do that, let's look at it. Jesus was in there and he wasn't alone. And he did that. He turned their money over in the temple and walked out and took over the courtyard, the temple courtyard, which um, was 33 square acres. No one man can do that. Wouldn't let anyone pass through. He occupied the temple with his followers. This was a huge transgression, not just against the temple, but against their Roman, uh, against the Romans, because the Romans were their sponsors. And the Romans were, uh, did not want any kind of e excitement or any kind of problem uh, under their watch, because they were always afraid of, of riots, of riots happening. But nothing happened to Jesus. Why? Because he had folk with him. And people were afraid or unable to do, to do anything about it. That's important. He, this is a demonstration against the exploitive institution. It's almost like, well, the temple was a major institution. It's like us uh, having a demonstration taking over the White House. I mean, it was major, major. All right, so he left. But we must remember that before he did this, it's, the scripture tells us that he came in the temple and looked around and then left and went to the um, Mount of Olives and he came back. He looked around because he was scoping it out, how are we going to do this, and then he came, right? He came and did it. And um, I'm, going to, I'm going to skip uh, some of this um, because it's, it's long, but I want to get to the point All right. All right, well, let's look, go to 1241. Mark 
All right. Now, this is interesting because we're talking about this widow's might, right? And I was taught, like maybe many of you were taught, that this is so it's very commendable action by this widow shows that she, she has of such a deep faith that she give everything that she had to the temple, not even any thing left to eat with. But it also says that Jesus went and sat down opposite the treasury, specifically the treasury of the priests in which they had all of their money. Some of it, one would say, might say, is ill-gotten. And he watched the multitude putting money into the treasury. He parked himself there for a purpose. Many rich people put in large sums, and a poor widow came and put in two copper coins, which, well, in English, would make a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said, and there are two ways of reading this. Truly I say to you, this widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For they all contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, her whole living. Or you can look at it this way. We saw in, in Jeremiah, it said, if, For if you truly amend your ways and your doings, if you truly act justly with one another, if you do not oppress the alien, the orphan, and the widow... And we read the Old Testament, one of the worst things you could do is not protect a widow, harm a widow, exploit a widow. Well, if we keep that in mind, Jesus sees a woman comes, put everything she had, and widows were, un, were really unprotected. Women without men had hard way to go. So she put all that she had in, didn't have anything left. So I would read like this. Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those putting money in the treasury, for they all contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, put in everything she had, her whole living. That is a doggone shame. Why would she do that? Because the priests have fooled people into thinking that the church or the priest, excuse me, the temple, is the most important thing in the world, more important than people's welfare. This is temple ideology he was, he was standing up against. The, the basic exploitive uh, uh, nature of <clears throat> that had come to be uh, the nature of the priesthood of, of his time. And so we see when Jesus is standing against them and, and fighting with them, the priests, well, that's the reason, because he's fighting against the temple ideology. It's, it's, it's a class thing. You have the poor folks standing against those who oppress, who oppress them. It's political. It's class. Jesus was a bad man. He wasn't playing. And that's some th one thing that we have, to, we have to keep in mind because if we, don't, if we don't lift up the radicality of Jesus, then we uh, are ignoring a major tool, a major source of the strength that we could use to stand against these forces of oppression. But the reason why they're running amok today is because we're not standing against him. Eighty-one percent of evangelicals voted for a man they know is a liar. They know is a cheat. It's documented. They know is a pathological liar. They know that. A man who has the morality of a flea. They know that. Eighty-one <coughs> percent. The power of Jesus' gospel ain't nowhere in there. Because they're not looking to change anything, make anything better, except maybe better themselves. And so it's important to lift, these, to lift this up. And that's why I raise these points. <coughs> All right. So next in the Lord's Prayer, so we have our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And just so folk don't get so heavenly mind if they ain't earthly good. Um, let me just say, uh, on earth as in heaven. Please remind some of these word preachers and these so-called charismatics that that is in the Bible, on earth. Not just in heaven. That's a good way to make money too, my people. If you do this, you'll get into heaven. Sow the seed into my pocket. 
I'm going to move on, but I got to tell you, the spiritual advisor of this crook who sits in the White House, I don't know how she became the pastor of a black church that was founded by a young black couple who just, who were so dynamic. These are uh, black folks, many of them poor. She not only talked about them um, planting a seed, doesn't, doesn't say who saw the seed is planted, but said also should make a, uh, an offering, what is it, the first fruits offering at the beginning of the year of $1,000. Mm-hmm. First fruits. Oh, Jesus. I mean, this is, this is too sick to even contemplate. Oh, Lord have mercy. And she gets away with it. We have to stand against. This is, this is that temple that temple ideology that Jesus was standing against, where the temple, they think that they can ask, they can extract as much as they want. And we let it happen. That's an obscenity. And if the Lord doesn't dwell in anyone's house, but he dwells in, in heart, well, there's nothing wrong with going and, and demonstrating in some of these churches. They're buildings housing institutions, and if they're doing wrong, we should, we, should, we should be able to challenge them. I know that sounds radical, but so is cleansing the temple. All right. On earth as in heaven, give us this day our daily bread. Whoa, why would he have them talk about that? Why would he say when you pray and when you talk about your, uh, <coughs> pardon me, when uh, you ask God what you should be concerned about, why would he say, pray, give us our daily bread? Why? Because the people were poor. And bread was their basic staple. Um, and if you've ever been in the Middle East, boy, their bread show is good. Them big old fluffy pitas, whoo. Man. I've been there about five, six, seven times. I come back heavier every time I, I go. And Lord help me, I'm still wearing that heaviness too, them pounds. Poverty was, Jesus talked about poverty so much because poverty, um, poverty extended all over the land. It permeated the society. Um, there were two classes in Israel. They were very rich. They were the rich and the poor. The very rich and the very poor. Jesus wasn't middle class. There was no middle class. You were very rich or the very poor. Jesus was a carpenter. Well, in those days, they didn't have carpenters unions where they could uh, advocate for higher wages. Uh, and by the way, the word translated as carpenter, tectone, also means manual laborer. There's no, there's no manual laborer who gets rich. Jesus was part of the peasant class. So someone go tell Creflo and all those people talking about he's rich because the Bible says, in my father's house there's many mansions. He doesn't realize that mansions is the old archaic translation of rooms, which means that there's room for you and me at the end. But it was so bad that the rabbinic writings gave instructions of how to distribute the poor tithe in such a way that it uh, wouldn't cause the people to stampede the poor people to stampede. I mean, we're, we're talking about real hunger. I mean, even in the Magnificat, where Mary, the Magnificat says, uh, my soul magnifies the Lord. In it, she says, um, she thanks the Lord for filling the poor with, uh, with good things. She's play, praising that the Messiah in her womb, that what he will inaugurate is, a, is, is an understanding uh, 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 a commitment, a way that is focused on giving people enough to eat. Even in the Magnificat, they're talking about that. <clears throat> mm, mm, mm. Not only that, taxation had a lot to do with the poverty. Peasants typically uh, engage in subsistence farming, which means that they only really uh, produce enough to, uh, to live. No surplus to sell or give away. I'll just put it. OK, thank you. No surplus to give away. 
if that's the case, giving away 25%, paying 25% in taxes is terrible. It's going to, it's going to starve you if you don't find some way to make up the difference. Sometimes, and then on top of that, the priests wanted their tithe. And then often they had <clears throat> Roman soldiers come through villages who, who would look for provisions along the way. I mean, the people were, were, were very, very impoverished. Um, uh, it's estimated that the daily caloric, um, the, the caloric volume of the food they ate was less than 2,000 calories. 1,200 calories will make you lose weight. So the people were, as it has been described, <clears throat> their life was so precarious, it was like someone standing in a, a river with the water all the way to the nose such that a, a, a ripple could drown them. That's the situation that they were in. And so Jesus said, give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our debts. Ophelemata means financial debts. I mean no trespasses. Ophelia <laughs> mean, not only means forgive, but it also means release. So he said, pray, release our debts. Because debt was that, because they are mired in debt. Debt was, it was so bad that people would default on debts. And sometimes they were loaned money so they could default, so they'd lose their land. The priests did that too. Priests were, were one of the major depositories of capital, so they did a lot of the lending. And that's a whole nother, whole, whole nother story. But folk would go into default, so they'd lose their land. And if that wasn't enough, they'd be sold into slavery. You have a family and you're told that somebody's got to go into, into slavery. Well, one of the parents, the adults, they got other children. So they can't allow themselves to be sold in slavery as they want because they need to be there to look out for the other. So they have to decide which of their children they're going to sell into slavery. Release our debts so we don't have to go through all this. We know that. Oftentimes, they even, if, if enslaving a family or an entire family does not pay the debt, uh, that they would go to their nearest kin. Well, they go through the extended family if it's there. If that's not enough, they would go to the neighbors to sell them into slavery. We know of one example in which, this is in Egypt, the same kind of political economy, in which a whole village was sold into slavery or ran up into the hills to hide uh, because of the debt of one family. Release our debts, Lord. So Jesus is, is, this Lord's prayer is, it reflects and is in response to the conditions of the time. And uh, release our debts as we have released the debts of others. In other words, because we're not doing to other folk what we don't want done to us. We have, we're stepping outside this system as best we can. We don't want to replicate it because we want for our neighbor what we want for ourselves. And today, that has a lot of resonance today in a couple of reasons. One thing is that, you know, debt kills a lot of people. Uh, their lifestyle is, you know, many folk walking around uh, Tents end up with heart attacks because they're so concerned about being in debt and all of that, or they're not able to do the things that they need to do um, because they are in debt. But also, there's another phenomenon that really should not be and is reminiscent of. of the exploitation in Jesus' time, I don't mean any harm to anyone. I don't know what anyone does. And please uh, forgive me, this is not personal. I'm talking about a phenomenon. But we have institutions that exploit people. They're based on exploiting poor people. Cash checking places. 
that will end up making a person pay for a debt 35, 40 times over, if they can do that. They're based on exploiting poor people. And these are the kinds of things that we should not let stand. The church should really be standing against these things. I mean, we, they come to the community, we need to go out and say, look, we don't, no, we don't want this in our community. Also lobby our, our policymakers to outlaw these. But instead, we stand by and let it happen. And with uh, this current regime, um, it's, even, it's getting even worse. Do you know the Consumer Protection Agency? You read that? Came budget time, he requested no money to help him do the job. He came there to do away with the Consumer uh, Protection Agency to protect people. They don't want to protect consumers. So we're talking about, you know, make me want to holler. We're, we're, we're talking about, we're, in many ways, we are in an in, in analogous situation with, with, with the conditions that Jesus directly fought against. We are in a kingdom of injustice that is getting worse and that is hardly being challenged. And it needs to be challenged. And churches have the numbers and the power and the righteousness, the righteous cause in order to do it. I'd like to, just one thing I want to, um, this came to my mind, I, it's, it's really a, a tangent, but before I, I forget, I mentioned something about the, uh, I don't know if I mentioned the Holy Trinity, did I? Well, let me, say, let me just set something straight. You look at first, the only place in the Bible that says the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost one is in the King James version of uh, King James translation of 1 John 5, 7, I think, and which is a mistranslation because the Greek does not say that. It says something like the, the spirit, the blood, and the water are in agreement. Or spirit, the blood, and the flesh, I forget exactly, that they are in agreement. It doesn't say that Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. So when they came up with this, the council says, you must believe this in order to be a Christian good standing. They didn't have the right to do that. So you, nothing's wrong believing in the Holy Trinity, but nothing's wrong if you don't believe in the whole, Holy Trinity. What I'm saying is, what's, what is our point of reference is in the Bible and not what has come, has come later. The divine right of kings, like in England, God appointed me king, all this stuff. It, it's just, we must cut through all of that. We must cut through Romans 10, is it, that it says that give uh, all, all authority is worthy of all respect, is that? 13. And um, contextualizing it, Paul is talking to a, a, a beleaguered folk and trying to tell them how to live in a way in a way so that they don't get torn up. That's also with the, we see them turn the other cheek. Turn the other cheek and do not uh, resist evil. When Jesus t tells these things, he's telling folk who are powerless how they might nonetheless assert their agency in life. And so for instance, when he said, well, if they uh, ask you to go um, uh, carry a mile, go the extra mile. Well, the extra mile, a Roman soldier could tell you to um, stop anyone. Sister, even you could stop you and say, look, uh, I know you're a woman, but my armor is heavy, and I want you to carry. Legally, you could carry for one stadium, let's say one mile, right? Um, and let's say you're a man. And in those days, you had, you know, had the male patriarchy and the honor and all that. And someone comes up and says, hey, hey, boy, carry this for me. And your children, they're looking up at you. And you can't say anything uh, without getting hurt. So what you do? All right, man, I'll carry it. And comes to that, that mile, okay, I'll get it. No, man, no, I got it. I got it. I'm, I'm deciding. I'll take it that extra mile. Away just asserting your own, uh, uh, your own agency. Um, 
turn the other cheek has to do with being insulted. And if you are in, if you're insu insulted, essentially it's saying, well, let me give you an example. What might I mean? There's a woman in South Africa, I wrote about in this politics of Jesus, walking down the street, this was doing apartheid, walking down the street with her children. And apparently she didn't get off the sidewalk quickly enough for this uh, Afrikaner coming toward her. So he spat in her face. And she had her children there. This is apartheid. She couldn't do anything about it. So did she shrink away? No, she said, well, thank you, sir. And now for my children. And he didn't know what to do. He was so shocked. It was, she, she asserted her agency. He said the man turned around and ran down the street. All right. So these are the kinds of things that we, that we need to know. That, but this, these are the mis, in, misinterpretations that keep us uh, oppressed, keep, us, keep our hands tied. For instance, we're told, well, Christians shouldn't get angry. Well, Jesus got angry. And Mark, he's angry all the time. You see seeing people uh, abused and you don't get angry? But I was raised like that. Christians, now Christians should be, should not get angry. No, man, we think, you think Jesus was happy in the temple? I'm turning your tables over. I'm just having fun. <coughs> we forgive debts of others. For we have forgiven the debts of others. In other words, we want this whole system changed, and we're not going to participate in it any more than we absolutely have to, even if it costs us a little something extra. That's so very important. What does that mean? That we're not just looking out for ourselves. We're looking out for the collectivity. Christianity is not individualistic. It is about the salvation of the community of everybody. That is why Simeon is in the temple day and night praying for the consolation of Israel. Consolation of Israel, the consolation of his people. From what? From Roman, uh, Roman oppression. He's not in there praying for himself. He's praying for the people. As we said, there's no word for, in, for no word for individual, and that points to something else. There's a misunderstanding that the most important thing in the Bible is freedom, liberty. That is not the main biblical ethic. The main one is responsibility. We shouldn't be talking about. You, you hear them talking about it, the conservatives. Well, we're talking about freedom and li no, but yeah, freedom. Freedom in, in relation to responsibility. The Samaritan, the good Samaritan was talking about, no, nah, man, look, I don't have to do that. Let me tell you something else. You ever hear of libertarianism, the political? Libertarianism, libertarian justice says, essentially, your responsibility is really only to yourself. If you don't help other people, that's not unjust. Nothing's wrong with it if you want to help them, but you're not wrong if you don't. That's the truth. It's, it's, it's. It's patently selfish. But here we have conservative Christians, and, they, and that's, what they, that's what they cleave to. When you read in the papers, they're talking about libertarian this, libertarian that. That's not Christian. So it's not just about liberty. The most important thing is liberty. Like, that's individualistic. The most thing, important thing is responsibility so everybody can have some liberty, so everybody can be free. Well, <clears throat> what I've tried to do well, let me, this last verse. Um, and lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. It, it appears that that is, it's not in the Luke, the Luke and Lord's Prayer. It's in the Matthew, in Matthew's Lord's Prayer. And, uh, and we believe that it was added by Matthew. Uh, maybe, he, maybe he heard it. And by the way, this prayer was not, if it was a model prayer, it was repeated over and over, so maybe by the time Matthew got it, it had them in it. But I, this is the way I understand it. Um, do not let me deliver us from evil. It means, it comes right after you talk about um, letting go, not participating anymore. It's almost like saying, 
and protect me from backsliding, from going back and doing the same doggone thing, huh? That's not a cuss word, is it? If it is, I apologize. Um, and so the Lord's Prayer, I mean, think about how holistic the Lord's Prayer is. It's just repeated by more than anything by Christians. Second, uh, well, maybe tied with um, 23rd Psalm, but, that, but the Lord's Prayer is up there. It's repeated all the time, but it's stripped of its power. Think about if we really focused on the radicality of this prayer, what that could do for the church. And so what I've tried to do is share um, not just the radicality of the Lord's Prayer, but to use it as an entry into, as a microcosm of, of the conditions um, in the world of Jesus that Jesus' ministry was working to, uh, to change, to address, to make this world uh, a world of freedom and justice and equity and bring down God's kingdom of justice on earth as in heaven. Thank you, and we'll take some questions now. Hey, thank you for your time. I was just wondering, right, um, I heard a sermon a long time ago about the waiting room, and then I heard a sermon about living above the fence. And just the way that I think, I know God put all these people in place. He had to, all things come through Jesus Christ, as we know, and I'm just paraphrasing, but, you know, God knew all this would happen. He knew these people would be our president, he knew this person would be our pastor. He knew you would be here today speaking with us, first and foremost. And I noticed, like, that, you know, it's very important that we teach our young people how to, how to stand up, how to carry themselves, you know, so we don't get involved in mass incarcerations and things of that nature. But I often also notice how we continue to criticize other individuals. And, you know, I, I do see, like, where certain pastors or preachers or educators, you know, we all are entitled to our own opinion. But God already knew these things, and I feel sometimes we focus on um, the wrongdoings of other people mm. instead of looking at the, the loving aspect of it. Because Jesus, you know, he didn't preach on Judges and Joshua where there were, where there were a lot of, you know, violence and things going on. And in Leviticus, he actually stopped short as you mentioned about, you know, loving your neighbor as you love yourself. But my question to you is, as, as he sent, you know, his, his people, I would say, to um, Pharaoh into slavery, you know, what is God trying to show us? Because our country was divided long before Trump stepped in. All right. Our, well. our country was in shambles long before Obama became our president. And... Okay, brother, I, I think I'm I got sorry. the gist. I, I didn't mean to, That's all right, know, brother. No, I appreciate it. It's a good question. But I'm just saying, you know, what is God trying to show us here? Well, you know, one thing is um, we are created with free will, as I understand it, number one. One can choose to do right. One can choose to do wrong. Number two, we talked about the prophetic imperative. The prophetic imperative is to Im is to oppose the things that are harmful, deleterious, exploitive, and destructive to our brothers and sisters. Now, sometimes you can't do that without pinpointing the source of those things. Right. Now, I, I hear you, and I mention names, and not like I don't do it with some trepidation, but sometimes it's meaningless if you don't give an example of what's happening. Um, I can, some of these individuals, I didn't talk about their family life, they did this, I didn't say anything about them other than their, what they were teaching and doing in the name of Jesus, which to my reading of the Bible contradicts the reading of the Bible. We have a responsibility, not just the right, but a responsibility to do this. Let me tell you something about anger real quick. Uh, Mark 1 40 and the leper came to him begging him on his knees and kneeling to him said if you will you can make me clean move with pity he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him I will no 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 that's a variant that word is a variant the word there's a different Greek word that shows up elsewhere that means filled with anger 
not only does it mean filled with anger, it means snorting with anger because it, it reflects snorting of horses. Jesus was angry that a young man's coming to him, begging on his knees, begging, please let me come back into society. That's anger. That's righteous anger. We have the right and the responsibility. And if folk do not get angry uh, about the injustices they see, they must, we must question, uh, question what, what we really believe in. Do we believe in a God of justice? So your, your question's a good one, but God knew, knows everything, but God doesn't control us like rob, rab, um, robots, as I, as I understand. Um, we, that's why there's good and evil. If, there was, if we were controlled by God, there'd be no evil, right? So thank you, brother. Yes, sir. I think you're next, yeah. Yes, uh, yes, uh, yeah, I do. I do have. I have a um, question. Mm -hmm. when, when, when you feel like when when things get under your skin, when, when you feel like cussing and when you feel like losing your temper and feel like hitting something, what what what, what do you do so, so, so that I can learn to overcome it? Good point. That's a good question. Well, what do I do, or what should the Bible say we should do? <laughs> well, I tell you, brother. Um, Sometimes you gotta let it out, man. I don't know. It 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 depends. Let me tell you something. If somebody is attacking my granddaughters, one of my granddaughters, uh, they're in trouble. If I have to cuss, if I gotta throw hands, whatever I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do it. There's a time and a place sometimes, and that's what I'm saying. Um, we we should not. We should have self-control, of course, and we should not look to to uh, attack people. And uh, and get mad and fight the insults and all those kinds of things. I, I, I do I do uh, understand on that. But what are you that, asking on then? Some, 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 uh, sometimes when things uh, frustrate me, for instance, like, for instance, the, the, a few days ago on uh, on the, the, the navigate my cell phone, it was on uh, acting up, it was acting funny, funny, funny while I was on doing on uh, Uber, and that uh, frustrated me. Me, I, I saw the uh, I saw I saw a slam the door to my car. Mm. So. Well, that's a small thing. If it frustrates you, you have to learn to frustrate, you know. That's part of being an adult, right? Expl uh, handling yeah. frustration. That's, yeah. Yeah. that's yeah. a different yeah. thing. That doesn't have to do with, with anger. I don't want to, if you don't mind, I don't want to pursue, you know, take any further because we I think we've sort of dealt with that. But, but thank you. Yeah. I see, yeah. I see your yeah. point. Thank and you very all, much, brother. Yeah. And, and, all, and, also, and also another thing, too. Uh, last night when, when, when the federal government, uh, when, I, when I heard that federal government shut down, I was hurt last night. My heart was broken. I, I was crying. I understand. I understand, I understand brother. Myself, so that I can let that grief out of me. Yeah, no, I understand, brother. No, I understand what you're saying. It's sometimes we got to deal with it. But that's. But let's move on, brother. Let me get to the next person, okay? Thank you. Okay. Can I ask you a quick question? Hello? Can I ask you a quick question? Yes. Yeah. When is your book coming out about Christians against Christianity? I'm not and where can sure. we buy it? I'm still working on it. I will, I'll, I'll be glad to let y'all know, though, to be honest with you, thank you for your interest in it. Because, sister, let me tell you, I don't, I'm not playing this book. They're going to be knots on heads, and I, it needs to be done. And my publisher told me, now, we don't want to mention names, and I said, well, look, you know, take your advance back, because uh, I'm going to name names. We, I'm not going to do it maliciously, but, you know, Sometimes you gotta name names. You, you know what I mean? If, if you can just name a position or something like that, that's fine. You know, because I don't want to just call names, but sometimes you have to. And so I'm gonna do whatever I have to do if the Lord allows me to finish it and to live. I mean that. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yes. So my question is not a question per se, just some ponderings, kind of building on what the gentleman that was uh -huh. here before me. Um, it's gonna be like four things, and then if anything speaks to you that you can respond to or whatever. So even if Donald Trump doesn't have the morality of a flea, isn't God still at work? And if God is still at work, what role or responsibility do we have into whatever that work is, even if it is that God put Donald Trump there to be someone that we can put a name to, identify a position to help you know, bring out freedom, justice, equality. Okay, now, let me just deal with that real quickly. Can there's I no just reason. do them and then you pick one? No, I'm wanna... just going to deal with okay. that real quick. Right. There's no okay. reason. There's nothing that says that God put Donald Trump in office. Well, wait I, a minute, I'm wait not a saying minute. that. I'm saying Just because he's if. there, just because he's there, uh, I mean, God, God didn't put Hitler in office, I understand. You know what I'm saying? So um, 
I think that's the first, that's the first point. And so there are those who say God put him there, and so there must be a reason for it. Well, maybe there's a reason for it, but all I know is that we are supposed to stand up against right. injustice okay. and against evil. And so that's, he must be stood up against and not say that God has put the divine imprimatur on him like, like many of the uh, evangelicals are and saying. And so again, one of my ponderings is regarding the system or you know, whatever it is we're operating under. Um, you know, we have to operate within a construct, a confine or whatever, but I also believe, you know, sort of like what you're saying, we have the ability or authority to operate either, if not outside or beyond the system. So then identifying what forces are at work and what should we be fighting within the system and is it beyond what we should be thinking that we can operate within the system for change as well as not be subject to the system even if we are operating or existing in the system and then last no, how I'm should sorry. we I, I gotta go one by one because i don't have the best memory today don't worry don't worry am i trying sister okay. i'm not gonna hurt you so so um i almost forgot it already i can't remember what about it, what the system won. and um, working within the system if it's a, yeah, if well, we you think it should something something we should be fighting or the wrongs or can we still be in the system and operate yeah. outside of or beyond the I, system. I got you. No, we're, we're supposed to operate according to certain kind of, the certain ethics that Jesus taught us, right? So um, justice, righteousness, love, and, and truth. And uh, if we approach every policy, for instance, if we, we're policymakers, if we refract every policy through that constellation of ethics, that's what we, that, that determines, you know, what, what we do. Um, a lot of people don't understand. Karl Marx was was a very spiritual guy. Why? He because he was trying to come up with a system that would help the that would help the workers from uh, get them from under the, the burden of uh, of of oppression and exploitation. Now, you know, I'm not going I'm not going any farther. Now he was a ut utopian, but what he did not have was a basic uh, enunciated ethical constellation. Um, it was an implied one. But for us, we know that there are certain principles by which we do things. And so if we're going to change society, it has to be done, done that way. Okay. And then finally, something you said that I kind of believe in too. I don't necessarily believe in devil, but there is something at work. What should we be allowing to inform our belief, our perspective. While I don't believe in the devil, I feel that I have had experiences that have forced me to come to terms with there are some factors at work. And then, mm -hmm. you know, in yeah. light of those factors that at work, how I should, you know, uh, further no. evolve my belief and then what I should be fighting or what my, how I move through life and what should be important to me or what I should succumb to okay. or I choose to fight based okay, on my experience. And I don't have a, um, a definitive answer to that. Thank you, thank you very much. I don't have a definitive answer to that. I do know that justice and love are talked about a lot more than, than the devil. And that if we are proactively um, seek fighting for and struggling for justice um, based on love, trying to live righteously, trying to live tr truthfully, um, those things that are, are, are evil um, will have to fall in our wake, or at least we will be confronting them. I define evil as something that is destructive to any of God's children uh, from one to the other. I mean, you know, uh, rock slides aren't evil, but people who throw rocks and hit children are evil. So that's, that's what I'm saying. That's where it comes down to, to holding these ethics in the, in the palm of our hand, justice and love are the most important. We must fight for justice, for justice, for, for everybody being subject to love your neighbor as yourself, everybody being subject to uh, the Good Samaritan's lesson. And that's how we approach whatever we approach. You know? So we don't have to come up with a new system. If we do those things, eventually we'll evolve something new. It'll come out of that. Okay, yes, who, yes, ma'am. Dr. Hendricks, this is from our online community, so thanks to all who are online watching us right now. But you said earlier that the aristocracy used taxes and tithes to oppress the people. To exploit the people. Mm -hmm. To exploit the people, okay. Um, right now here at Alfred Street, we're in a series called Money Matters, a sermonic series. Mm -hmm. 
Could you please clarify the difference between using the tithes to um, exploit versus God's mandate to tithe? Okay, well, all right. <laughs> Let me say first that there are some, uh, there are some, and many of you have experienced it, there are some great benefits, personal, spiritual benefits from tithing. Um, that's very important. Biblically, though, tithing, the purpose of tithing was to support the temple and those who administered it. When the temple was destroyed, the responsibility to bring tithes to the storehouse uh, also uh, ended. And so there's nothing wrong with paying tithes. There is something wrong with threatening people uh, that they're going to go to hell or the Lord don't love them. They don't, they, uh, they tithe. Also, if one is part of a community, we have a responsibility to help support that community. And 10% is a round number that's easy for everybody to figure out. And also, but when you do that, there's a certain discipline and a certain benefit that comes out of it. And I'm not talking about, you know, sow a seed. Um, that's, no, 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 no. And y'all, if y'all, any of y'all do that, sow a seed to some of those folk on, on TV, write them and ask for your money back. Or, also, or ask them where is, who, what soil is the seed planted in? Because they don't ever tell that. They just say, sow a seed. Lord, don't even get me started. Um, did I respond to, what was the second part of your question? That was it? Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Really quick, um, you mentioned a book earlier in, the, in your message. Um, I, I was trying to write it down and I'm not sure what, um, what the name of it or what the title of was it, but do you remember? What was it? A, a, oh, Wretched, Wretched yeah. of the Earth. Okay. By Fanon, F-A-N-O-N. -N. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. Yes, ma'am. Um, my question, ooh, <laughs> my question is, when you were speaking about the signs of oppression, such as like issues with the menstrual cycle, um, lameness, those type of things, to me, I feel like those symptoms are seen in our society now. So we are showing signs of an oppressed people and also, when you were speaking just about how people get hung up on what people believe in, not how they behave, my question is, what would you say is the solution to healing these signs of oppression, given that people believe so many different things? That's, that's, that's important. Well, I think one, uh, this doesn't directly impinge upon it, but um, someone mentioned earlier where Jesus said, they're sheep, not of my flock. Um, religion is not supposed to divide people. It's supposed to bring us together. And so if, again, we focus on justice and love and not get caught up into a whole lot of doctrines that not, don't necessarily go back to Jesus anyway, then we, we, we bring some of these barriers down. And even if we believe in something that, um, that might seem that, that it's against what someone else believes, if it's not doing anyone any harm, right? If it's not in unjust, if it's not unloving, then don't have to, we don't have to worry about that at all. Uh, secondarily, you, you said, how do we, how do we heal? Um, that's interesting because you know that a lot of these gang bangers, a lot, a lot of these, Young men and women, you look at them, they seem, they're not only, they look fearless, but sometimes just that they don't value their own lives. They're hopeless. Many of them, many of them suffer from deep depression and do not know it. Um, and so um, part of what we have to try to do is, is to um, make this society uh, more loving, more responsible uh, for the common good, because if 
if the conditions that, that cause folk to be angry, um, hateful, self-hating, if we can ameliorate th them to some extent, then that will heal a lot. Also, people, poverty, a lot of the problems are a result of poverty, you know, poor health that makes people act certain kinds of ways. This side and the other has folk, you know, folk drinking. You know, I mean, people use drugs sometimes to salve their pain. So, I mean, it, what, what it really comes down to is seeing that Jesus was talking about loving our neighbor as ourselves, meaning looking at us all as a collectivity and, and not talking about, yeah, well, I'm saved, unless other people are saved too. We shouldn't just be concerned about our own personal salvation. If that's what you're doing, I don't know, because that's, I mean, what is, how is that serving, how is that really serving um, God's children? I mean, other than you're not going to be out, you know, knocking heads or something. You, you know what I'm saying? It's just, we have to stop seeing it as just us. Paul talked about those things, but he came from a different kind of epistemology, a different kind of, 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 of culture. And he talks about salvation, but when we really read through the line, Paul's, he's still talking about community. Because he talks about raising money for the Macedonians, looking out for this, looking, at, looking out for each other all the time. And that is not, the church has become so individualistic that that's one reason why there's so much uh, pathology in the church. You can have people in the church who are hurting to death, and you can see it. They come every Sunday, but nothing happens. Nobody, mm. nobody addresses it. So uh, I'll leave it there. I'll leave it there. I think you're next, sister. I was just going to have a comment in regards to the young lady who asked about how we would heal um, ourselves from some of the conditions. and. Uh, I guess God has been putting it on my heart as a pharmacist uh, and a person in the health profession. I'm seeing all the attacks that the society has had on health and how poverty and everything contributes and injustices and all that we endure contributes to the health issues mm -hmm. that we have. But not only that, a lot of the medicines that are out there, they're not intended to cure people. They're not even trying to cure people. They want mm. to keep us taking these things. Mm -hmm. So he had put it on my heart to try to uh, move our congregations and our people toward more healthy living and that we can actually heal ourselves through uh, natural methods and um, you know, exercise and eating, and that's what we got to do too to free our people from that mm -hmm. injustice mm -hmm. and being bound to that system mm -hmm. because it's mm -hmm. not a system that's intended to really heal us. It's intended, as you said, to uh, for people to make money. And doctors and medicine should not be for profit. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very good, important point. Thank you. So I have a question about righteous anger, and this is probably because I've been trying to reconcile this for myself. Um, so I, I understand, you know, the biblical references that you uh, addressed, but I have um, this one person in particular who comes to mind who everything is righteous anger. Like, you know, they're mad about the political system. They're mad if their sandwich isn't right. They're mad that I'm not mad enough, you know. <laughs> so I'm just, you know. I don't know if that's righteous. I gotta tell you the truth. <laughs> that sounds like just a problem. And and that's, I guess that's the thing because I, this person is a friend of mine, and I'm always not addressing it. I just kind of let it be. But at some point, things bother me because it's it almost seems like you. They take this righteous anger and blanket it on everything. Well, why and did you say it's righteous anger? Because that's how they address it. You know, that's like, I'm, I have a right to be mad. But right, that, that's not righteous anger, right? Okay. <laughs> I mean, it, righteous anger. I right, understand that, but I guess I'm trying to... Righteous means doing, doing right, doing justice. Uh-huh. And if it's not about, about that or helping somebody, it's not really right. If it's not about standing up against an injustice, a real injustice or something mm -hmm. like that, it's not righteous anger, it's complaining. And so, 
it's an anger management issue. Yeah. But, right. But I get so my my other part of that is how you know because you said that we are to stand up, and this partly goes back to a conversation I had with someone else about not seeing leadership in our community now, like Martin Luther King and and these people, um, and this. They're always looking at me like, don't you have these answers for why we don't have leadership? And I'm like, what, what do you want me to, to do? Okay, and your question <laughs> is? My question is, is there, do you still see a need for someone like Martin Luther King mm. Jr. Well, in this period today? And if, not, if you do, why do we not see this? And also, what can we as the church do? Because I feel like, well, Alpha Street things. is very active, but is there more that we should be doing? Well, there's, yeah, there's different things. As far as a, I don't know. I mean, what, I don't, the HNIC syndrome is a problem. <laughs> really, it's a problem. And, uh, and uh, sister, this, you, you'll be the last question. Um, it's, it's a problem. Um, but folks don't understand Martin Luther King anyway. Martin Luther King was self-sacrificial. Do you know that Martin Luther King was deathly afraid of jail because of something that happened early on in his career, a terribly traumatic experience that he had? It's just unbelievable. But he stood, but when it was time to go, he'd go. He wouldn't complain. Sometimes he wouldn't, come, wouldn't let him bail him out because he believed what he had to do. Also, Martin Luther King had a vision for what the world should be. He wasn't just going, and I'm not knocking anybody, because I'm really not, because some of these guys are my personal friends, but it's not just about, about reacting to, uh, to various uh, injustices, though that's important to highlight them, but he had a vision of what the world should be. Also, he critiqued the system. He had an analysis of the system. He critiqued capitalism. He talked about democracy, what it is and what it isn't. Um, you know, the, the radicality of his thought is just not not understood fully at all. So what we have today, we have no one doing that. Um, I had a conversation with Al Sharpton one day. Oddly enough, he said, brother, you know, I want to talk to you because we need more analysis. Um, and I said, well, that's interesting. That's not his thing. You know, he has a different role, but it's important. The, the most brilliant one out there, in my experience, um, it's someone who's not really, who's, who star as, as descended at some point, but that's descended at some point, uh, it's Jesse Jackson. He's brilliant, brilliant. He has a brilliant mind, a brilliant analysis, but he hasn't, but he sees his fundamental role as going out and, and addressing things as they, as they occur. If you listen to him, he'll give these tidbits, brilliant tidbits, but he doesn't really bring it to full analysis. He can. The point I'm making is no one is doing that that I'm aware of. They think that Martin Luther King is just about marching and about being a good preacher. And Martin Luther King is about reading and understanding, uh, uh, analyzing, learning how to analyze the, the political economy, and also uh, analyzing uh, policies, um, uh, prescriptively, in other words, what kinds of policies we should have, or, or, or analyzing policies, the kind of policies that we have that we shouldn't have. But there are not a lot of us involved in policy management. Um, we're just allowing these things to go on ar around us. We have to take responsibility, I believe, not, not as a people, not only as a people, but if we talk about Christians or about this and that, we have to take a responsibility and decide what kind of world we have. Think about it. How many people talk about the, the kind of world that we want in, more, in, 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 in even somewhat specific terms? There's no vision of the world we want other than we want racism, racism to end and we like poverty to end. But Martin Luther King was a democratic socialist. Well, a lot of people, a lot of black people, socialism, I ain't bothered with communism. It's not communism. <laughs> socialism, there was, there's socialism in the Bible, in, in, in Luke, but we won't follow it. Socialism means that people are more concerned about the common good and, and, and about egalitarian justice, about everybody having uh, the, the same kind of access to the good things in the world. You don't have to get, get the same amount but you have to at least have equal access in the world. And that's what we don't have, but that's what we really need. William Barber is the only one that I know that's doing that. You're the last question, my dear. 
Thank you for being here. Um, you make me think. But I would like for you to revisit um, your um, remarks about putting um, the people on the pikes and the pathology that occurred to the people who saw that as a reminder not to be active. Um, I know of two um, times in history that that occurred. One was lynching in the South, the same psychology. Mm -hmm. And then there was on where I live, and I haven't researched it, but I kind of heard about it, that Indian Head Highway in Maryland, that's where they got the name from, from putting Indian Native Americans' heads on pikes along that road. So can you talk about the pathology of seeing that and what it would do to a people that caused them to be feared? Yeah, well, that's the purpose of it is, right, to put the depths of fear and horror in, in hearts. And, um, and it's, 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 they're still using that. Police terrorism, that's one of the reasons they're so brutal. Um, to keep folk in line, keep folk um, frightened. That's one reason why they attacked the, the Black Panthers so, so brutally and so homicidally, maniacally, right? In order to make an example of people and, and, fright, and frighten the people. Uh, that's why I'm so worried about the Black Lives Matter, uh, the Black Lives Movement, um, because you have officials saying the same thing about them as they said about the Panthers, that they want to kill the police and that they're violent, even though they are um, outspokenly, uh, and on their website says, we are nonviolent. So what does that mean? Well, I guess that means Martin Luther King is a good example of that. Fearlessness has to come back into it, and that fearlessness has to be a result of faith and strengthening. If we could strengthen ourselves, remember the movie Glory and the night before the battle, and how they, sat, how they clapped hands and they sang, and they, uh, and they, and, and they uh, testify to one another and, and share and strengthen one another, and then they could walk, they could go out and fight with with the name of the Lord in their mouths, and knowing they might not survive, but that they were doing what they were supposed to do. If we could do those things in our in our not necessarily Sunday church uh, service necessarily, but we got services. You know, we can have a social act. I mean. Uh, clubs and ministries we could have social action ministry something like that um and we just and also the other thing is in sunday school our our our, our young people can be taught to, to study some of the some of, of these freedom movements right so i think those that's what we what we can do but the trauma is always going to exist people are going to always uh be afraid as i grew up in the black nationalist movement i was a soldier in newark um, with amiri baraka i was I didn't care if I died. I was looking to die in the name of the revolution. And I was, y'all didn't, you didn't know me when I was, I was, I was something else, man. But as I've gotten older and older, it's like I'm not as willing to take, to, 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 to take the chance because I have people, resp uh, um, you know, d depending on me. But I'm not saying I won't do it, but I'm saying it's, it's a whole nother mindset. But if I was with a bunch of folk and we were, propping each other up and all that, I must say I believe that my faith would be stronger. And I'd say, well, if I fall, the fall, then I fall. The Lord will take care of me. And when I was young, I'll give you this example and I, then I'll end. I was in Israel for the first time. I was a single parent of a little girl. And I was in Israel the first time. And uh, this was 1980. And walking down the street with the teenage daughter of, uh, of the professor who had led us to... Um, Charles Worth, who had, who had led us on this, this study exposition. Walking down the street, look down the alley, we're in Jerusalem, old city of Jerusalem, and I see these soldiers rifle-butting this Palestinian brother on the ground. Now, the soldiers all look like they're like 14 years old. They're very young, and they're also frightened to death, right? And they have M16s, very dangerous. So I saw them beating, this, beating this, this, this young man. I'm saying, I can't just walk by, by this. I, I, you know, I wasn't no hero. 
I said, I can't, I can't walk by this. And I remember this distinctly. I remember saying, I might get killed, but if I do, my daughter will know I died doing the right thing and she'll be taken care of. And I must admit that I haven't all, that, that as I've gone through life, I haven't always had that same attitude. So what happened? I walked down toward them with my hands up so they could see nothing happened. They saw me coming. They picked up their guns and ran toward me, aimed at my head, and one of them said, no, no, he's an American. And that saved me, because I told the, the teacher's daughter, I said, go back and tell the others where I am and what I've done. Um, but that is because I was in seminary at the time. I was in a community where we were all strengthening each other all the time, and that gave me the power to do that. <clears throat> it would be harder for me to do it now, I probably would. <laughs> But it would be, 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 be a bit harder. I, I mean, I might, instead of walking like this, I might say, please, sir, please. Thank you all very much. I appreciate your attention. We want to thank Dr. Hendricks for um, his gifts. While you're waiting for the latest publication, The Politics of Jesus is available on Amazon. If you have Amazon Prime, you'll have it on Monday. All right, praise God. I want to thank the CLI board for all of their hard work. They're all seated right here on the front row. And thank you again.